the water goes down. The Bronx is up and the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York, it's a wonderful town. And now, it's time for Talkin' New York Sports with Billy C. and Brooklyn Mike, part of the BillyCBoxing.com network of programming. And here's your hosts, Billy C. and Brooklyn Mike. We're coming at you from the Billy C. studio in Lake George, New York. I'm Bill Calagero, and it's time for Talk in New York Sports with Billy C. and Brooklyn Mike. And speaking of Brooklyn Mike, Brooklyn Mike joins me right now. What's up, brother? Hey, brother. How you been? I don't know. It seems like forever since we've been doing this show, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the last time we did the show, uh, it was the Clinton administration. That's I, how long ago it seems. I think so. I, I, I didn't know if it was Clinton or Reagan, but uh, but I know it was a while ago. As a matter of fact, I uh, had sent out uh, uh, some uh, some copies of the shows to Jeremy, and uh, it's almost been a month, man. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, yeah, you were away for two weeks. You know, doing uh, calling some fights. I had a, a pilot that I was shooting in uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, called Sleepy Hollow, which is basically the story of you know Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman, blah blah blah. So yeah, we've both been kind of uh, going at it at both ends, but I'm glad we're back. And I mean, where do you start as far as uh, you know New York sports? Well, a lot of stuff has happened uh, over the last several weeks, and uh, let, let, let's let's kind of stick to our. Uh, uh, our thing. We'll, uh, we'll we'll talk a little about hockey and and you know the the NBA playoffs and uh, we'll get into a little New York boxing that's going to take place and then we'll get into the things that we're both dying to talk about, which is of course uh, Major League Baseball and NFL football. So um, first and foremost in hockey, you know something that is uh, very high on the priority list for both you and I. Um, you know both of the teams. Uh, well, actually, the the uh, Jersey team and the Buffalo Sabers aren't, aren't looking too good, but uh, the Islanders and Rangers are, are hanging on. Uh, uh, Rangers are up by a point. I mean, I'm sorry, the Islanders are up by one point. They have identical records, but I think the Islanders are ahead of the Rangers in in the playoff set scenario, right? Yeah, the Islanders are up 51 to uh, 50 points on the Rangers. They both have four games left. Um, you mentioned Buffalo, and basically the Rangers pretty much eliminated the Sabres last night. They uh, trounced them 8-4. Uh, to four. You know, they had three three goals at the end of the first period within like a minute and a half, and then they started the second period three goals within the first seven minutes. So they put they pretty much put a damper on uh, on Buffalo's chances of getting in. Uh, listen, the Islanders have been playing great hockey. I mean, this is a young team, I, I think, which has a brighter future than the uh, than the New York Rangers. Um, so I'm really, actually, I'm really excited about. It. Like, I, mean, I don't follow it like I used to in the days of Trottier and Bossy and you know the four Stanley Cups. But I, I will always be an Islander fan over uh, over the Rangers. Um, you know, they got a, they got a great, they just got a big game coming up. Uh, you know. Um, to, to try to solidify their playoff hopes. Uh, Islanders are actually playing Winnipeg, and a, and a win over Winnipeg would actually help the Rangers because Winnipeg is actually two points behind um, the New York Rangers. Well, how does it, uh, how does it unfold uh, when I, – I know the last I knew before yesterday's game with the Rangers, the Rangers were still battling for uh, the final spot, and the Islanders were – actually in the fifth or sixth spot. So, I mean, I, I know they're so close. So they got to be teetering back and forth. I mean, do the Islanders have a magic number? I mean, uh, they got four games left. If they win one, do they lock a spot? If they win two, do they lock a spot? What's the deal? No, it's, it's neck and neck. It's, it, they're separated by one point, and they both have four games left. And they're, they're, they're the seventh and eighth spots right now. Ottawa has the sixth spot with 52 points. I mean, they're all pretty much bunched up. And Winnipeg, like I said, who uh, the Islanders are playing today um, in uh, in Winnipeg, they're ninth ranked at 48 points. So basically, if, if and they both have and they have four games as well. So if Winnipeg wins today, beats the Islanders, then they have 50 points, which puts them in a tie for the Rangers. So I mean, they're all just interlocked right now. It's it's going to come down to the you know the final, basically probably the final game of the season for all three teams. Who's got the tougher schedule? The Rangers or the Islanders? Uh, you know, I don't have it in front of me, um, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say. But uh, this game with the Islanders and Winnipeg today does help 
the Rangers. I guess best case scenario, it, it's a it's a tie, so they only get one point apiece. Um, that's the best case scenario for the Rangers. Uh, you know, Islanders are playing really good hockey, so I, I think they're pretty much gonna t- make it. And uh, if if Winnipeg does beat uh, New York uh, today, um, it's gonna be tough for the Rangers to to get that eighth spot. You know, um, I, I'm surprised about um, uh, the Devils. I mean, this is a team that was basically in the playoff hunt and, and lost ten in a row. I well, mean, that's just, that's shocking. That's not a that's a very undevil like team. I mean, it, you never see that. You know. Well, if the so Island, I'm kind of surprised. If the Islanders lose to Winnipeg, Islanders play Winnipeg, and then and then I think tomorrow the Rangers play the Devils. And um, if you look at the Winnipeg team for the Islanders and the Devils for the Rangers, to me it seems that the Rangers have an easier path uh, to to catch uh, you know to catch a, a game up uh, on the Islanders. So I, I'm not sure after after tomorrow where where the teams lay. You know, so uh, it ought to be interesting. And I, and like you, I, I'm an Islander fan. And my question is, is I know that this was brought up um, several weeks back, but they are moving to Brooklyn. Are they going to maintain the Islander name? I, I mean, the whole thing about the Islanders yes. is they were uh, oh, good because I, I, yeah. I was I was hoping that they weren't going to change, you know, just like the Nets didn't change. Yeah, I mean, they, they already said that they're keeping the same logo um, and they're keeping the name. They're not nothing's changing. I mean, basically, uh, Brooklyn is attached basically attached to Long Island, so they're right neck and neck, you know. So, uh, yeah, and I don't think anybody wants to see, uh, you know, uh, the, the the emblem change. I mean, they, there was a big uproar when they changed it. You know, it looked like the Gorton Fisherman. I know, I don't like that. I don't, that was ridiculous. I, you know, I know. You I go back with the NY with the hockey stick, and it right. says Islanders on it, and, you know, that's that's what, you know, we're used to. Exactly. So, they was, you know, they, we went back to that, and, and they said that they're not going to change. Uh, they're going to leave it at that. Yeah, well, that's almost as bad as the new Dolphin Miami. We'll get to we'll talk to football later. Talk about football later, but the new Miami Dolphins logo looks pretty. It looks like uh, it looks like it should be a Disney character or something rather than an NFL football. But uh, uh, basketball. Let's talk about the hoops. You know, the the uh, the uh, Knicks. Uh, a few weeks back, I was going to talk about how they lost Stoudemire, but uh, it's non even non issue right now. They're they're playing great ball. Um, finish. Uh, uh, looks looks like they already finished the best season in in years. The Brooklyn Nets, though, on the other hand, they you know it, it, they're solid. They're in the playoffs and stuff. But I don't know. Are, are they in coast mode? Are, are are they gearing up for the playoffs or or what? They they haven't looked that great, even in winning. Well, I think they're fine. I mean, they're they're definitely going into this uh, playoff series against Chicago healthy. They're definitely the favored. Uh, team in, in, in this uh, in this series, um, you know Chicago. They don't have any scorers on the team besides um, you know Carlos Boozer. They're going to make this you know a very physical, a very slow paced game. Um, the Nets have uh, plenty of scores compared to uh, you know Chicago. Um, I, I don't see uh, really the Nets having any kind of trouble with this team. I mean, without without Derrick Rose. Um, Chicago team is is, is is very different. Uh, I would say this is that you know Brooke Lopez, you know, uh, even though he did you know make the All Star team this year as a reserve and he's had a tremendous year, he's still a soft seven footer. And what I mean by that, he just doesn't bang the boards as hard as uh, you know, let's say Noah of uh, of the Chicago Bulls. I mean that guy is just uh, he's just a beast under the boards and. Uh, you know, we don't need scoring from from Brook as much as we need physical play, and the scoring is going to come from Joe, uh, you know, Joe Johnson and and, and Deron Williams and those guys. And uh, you know, I, I'm thinking six games here. I, I don't see too much trouble from uh, from the Chicago Bulls. I, I think, yeah, like I said, they're going in very healthy. Uh, I think a big factor in this series is going to be uh, the play of uh, Reggie Evans. This guy is just a beast on the boards. And, and what uh, Lopez is not doing, what he should be doing, which is banging those boards, um, Reggie Evans will, will definitely pick up the slack for him. You know, you, you mentioned uh, the boards and stuff, and, and I, I laugh my butt off when every time I see that ESPN commercial with, uh, uh, what's his name, Natumbo? 
Remember yeah. the defensive guy? You know, guy, guys. Yeah. It starts no, no, off. No, no, not in my house. Right, right. It, star- it's, it starts off. The guy's in his office, and he he takes a shot with a piece of garbage into the into the uh, waste paper mm-hmm. basket, and he blocks it. And he was like blocking kids and stuff. I mean, uh, it was great. I love it. But uh, uh, you know, I, when you look at the seating in in any playoff uh, scenario, it, it always seems like those middle tier pl- teams. Um, are are in the toughest games, you know. The, the, the number one, the higher seeded teams are, are playing the weaker teams, and uh, you know that's the case with the Knicks. I I, I feel, you know, I, I think the Knicks. Uh, not that any game once you start the playoffs are are layup games, but you know I, I do think the Knicks. I, and and I'm not disagreeing with your, um, you know your your, your uh, breakdown of of the Nets and and Bulls, but. I think the Knicks have an easier first series. What, what, what do you think? Oh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, it would be a major disaster if the Knicks lost to uh, this Boston Celtics team. Um, in in doesn't matter six seven game doesn't matter if they lose it would be a disaster. This team should definitely roll over Boston. I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they sweep Boston. Boston just does not have a bench. Uh, their stars are uh, not exactly 100% healthy. Um, the Knicks are getting healthy. They were able to rest some players. Matter of fact, I went to the Knicks Charlotte game just last week, and and I basically saw the uh, you know the B unit for the New York Knicks. Everybody was just resting. They rested Felton. They rested uh, Mello. Uh, these guys should be. Uh, there should be no excuses. Um, and everybody's been talking about uh, Kevin Garnett getting into Mello's head. Well, you know what? That's 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 past history. That happened in January. Melo knows what Kevin Garnett is all about. And I'll tell you one thing that the, what the Nets, the uh, excuse me, the Knicks have now, which they didn't have in January, and that is Kenyon Martin. And let me tell you something: if Kevin Garnett tries to get into the ear of, of Carmelo Anthony, Kenyon Martin's gonna be like a pit bull, and he's gonna be all over this guy because he. I mean, don't forget. Kenyon Martin and Carmelo played together for, uh, for like seven years in Denver. I mean, these guys are teammates. They play well together. And this guy has just been a spark plug for the Knicks. They needed that toughness. They needed somebody else besides uh, Tyson Chandler to play defense. And, and this guy has done it. And if, if this team can maintain good health throughout the playoffs, um, I'm not saying they're going to beat Miami because I don't think anybody's beating Miami. But a successful season would be taking this Miami Heat team to seven games and, and losing in seven. And that's to me, uh, would be a successful season for the New York Knicks. Kmart's always been one of my favorite players. It saddened me to see him go uh, to the Knicks, even though he was on the Nets at one time. But uh, I agree with you there. And and the other thing is, is I hate to say this because... You never want to talk negatively about a, an injured player, but I, I got I to gotta be honest. I think the Stottlemyre injury and the question marks with him from the beginning of the season and ultimately ending the way a lot of us thought, um, I think it was the best thing for the Knicks. You know, there, there was just no controversy. There was no, there was no chance for controversy, and I think it's helped them because, uh, you know, the makeup of that team – you could have seen it going down a totally different path if they started uh, fighting amongst themselves, and and I think that uh, Stoudemire kind of is a, is a fuse for that. Well, I, I kind of disagree in the way you know we talked about this. Uh, you know, once he he first came back, and we said that listen, he just has to accept this role as being the sixth man off the bench. And, and, and playing limited time, he's no longer the star that he was in Phoenix, and he did do that, and he played well. And you know, listen, their their record without Amari Stoudemire is like you know thirty and five. I mean, they play just great ball without him. They don't need him. But you know, even if he was to come back, let's say the second round of playoffs, uh, you know, what's in what was he going to play him? You know, six eight minutes a game. I mean, you don't break up chemistry. He knows that, and he he'd only put him in you know just for to give guys a rest. I don't think it's – even like I said, even if he comes back, I don't think it's going to be a factor whatsoever. Um, they know they could play well without him. They don't need him. He's a shell of what he used to be. So, I, I, you know, I don't even think it's a question. You know, I don't even think you're going to see him, period. So uh, even if the, the Knicks get to the uh, Eastern Conference Finals, I don't think uh, we'll ever see Amari. And next year is next year. We'll, we'll deal with that uh, as it comes. But, um, you know, right now – 
this team is 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 poised to to make a decent run in the playoffs if they stay healthy. Tyson Chandler, you know, forget he he hasn't played Boston yet this year. Um, he's had that bulging disc in his uh, in his neck that's been causing him problems. Uh, he's he's played the first 62 games of the season. All of a sudden, he's played the last four out of 20. And, and, and to the Knicks' credit, they are 12 and four without uh, without uh, Tyson Chandler. So he's only going to help this team because you know what we always say about the Knicks: we got to play defense. We can you know we got Carmelo and J.R. Smith who can without a doubt you know light it up on the scoreboard, but you need defense and a guy like Tyson gives us that. And then you throw in um, Kenyon Martin. Yeah, you know, like I said, they're they're poised to make a, a, a decent run in the playoffs. Uh, quickly, what's your thoughts of the West Conference? Uh, um, you know, Kobe's out, you know, maybe done. His career may be done. Um, we got uh, some teams that you know I I had my eye on in the beginning of the season. They're they're going to be in the playoffs. I mean, how, how do you see the West shaking down? Well, I, I think the West is going to come down to the, basically the top two teams, which is Oklahoma City and uh, and San Antonio. Um, I think they both get uh, by the first round uh, relatively easy. I don't see San Antonio. Uh, having too much problem with the Lakers and uh, Oklahoma should should definitely take care of uh, Houston. Um, I guess a surprise team for me would be uh, you know Memphis. Um, you know they they're they're a good team. Um, you know if they could be my sleeper team in the West, but uh, you know listen, I, I basically see the, the the finals coming down to the two number ones. I don't think anybody is stopping Miami in the East. And uh, you know there were like three teams in in the in the West that could actually uh, beat every other team in the East. I mean I think the the West is just the more dominant uh, division. But I think it's going to come down to Oklahoma and Miami in the finals again. Well, you're not giving uh, the Golden State or or the Clippers any. Or the any. Clippers? Nope. Nope. You're not giving not. them a shot, huh? No, you you you're a, you're a Clippers guy. I like the Clippers. Yeah, yeah, I like Golden uh, State too. I like Golden State because of the history behind them, and 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 neither team has really, um, you know, been in this position in, in quite a while. So I, I love the underdogs, you know. So oh no, absolutely. I mean, I, it's it's great to see. I mean, the Clippers were a laughing stock of, uh, of the uh, you know of L A. basically because it was always the Lakers, and uh, everybody picked the, the Lakers to have what fifty nine, sixty wins this year, and look what happened to them. Um, yeah, even even if Kobe was there, you know, I don't think they're really going to advance into, into the playoffs. And uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I like I like Clippers. I like I like the underdog as well. But I just see I just see Oklahoma wanting to get there and play Miami again and 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 pretty much uh, you know get revenge on, on, on last year, which I, I don't think they will. I think Miami's a better team than last year, as a matter of fact. Yeah, no, they gelled much better. And, and and you know um, Oklahoma City, I, I, you know everybody loves them. They're small market and everything else. Except the NBA, you know, is secretly hoping that you know one of the uh, LA teams, you know, at least one of the teams, bigger teams, get in, you know, because of uh, of the markets and stuff. But uh, oh, of course. I mean, they'd even like they prefer San Antonio to get in over Oklahoma, but that's just, I don't see that happening. No. Um, let's talk a little boxing uh, real quick. There's a uh, a huge fight taking place in New York today. As a matter of fact, this afternoon, which is even better on regular TV, which is even better. Uh, yeah, NBC, Ty- right? Yeah, yeah, NBC yeah. Sports. Um, Tyson Fury, uh, who's a, 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 a fighter from England. Uh, I've been following him since his third fight, uh, his third uh, professional fight. He's a big kid. Uh, he uh, for a long time there he wasn't really improving much, but uh, in his last few fights he has improved. He's uh, been working with an American trainer. He's uh, uh, developed a jab, and uh, he's taken on uh, a, a, a pretty tough guy. Although he's out of his element. Uh, Steve U.S.S. Cunningham generally was a was a cruiserweight, but he showed pretty well up against Tomas Adamak. My question is, does he have a chance against Tyson Fury? Are you familiar enough with Tyson Fury to, to make a uh, prediction on the fight? Yeah, I, I, first off, with, with Cunningham, I, I believe he was ripped off in that fight. Against yeah, that I fight. agree. I agree. You know, um, I, listen, Billy, I just think he's just too small. Right. You know, he's uh, he's given away, what, about, about 35, 40 pounds 44. Tyson Fury? 44 How much? pounds. 44. 40, that's, a, that's a lot. Yeah. That's, that's like, like my leg. He's basically blown yeah. up cruiserweight. So um, I, I don't give him much of a chance, although, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to see him, uh, you know, give him a game effort. But I just think, you know, 
a good uh, big man is going to beat a good little man today. That's that's you know the bottom line. The 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 the, the bottom line is this, uh, in my opinion. Um, Tyson Fury is going to try to establish his jab and keep uh, Cunningham away from him and try to set up a a, a power shot. I mean, uh, that's that's what he's going to try to do. Um, as far as Cunningham is concerned, in the Adamac fight, he displayed that he, he was able to uh, uh, counterpunch pretty well, and he's still got some speed, and he stunned Adamac a couple of times. I think that's going to be his game plan. He's going to try to get in close. I, I just don't know if he can. Well, he's going to try and get in close, but don't forget, Adamac is uh, another blown-up cruiserweight. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, you know, listen, it, it's Tyson Fury, to me, from what I've seen, it's very... Uh, Quichko esque, like you said, jab, 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 throw that power shot, jab, jab, throw the power shot, and I think that's just what's going to happen to you know to Cunningham. I'd be very, very shocked if he was able to get inside and actually cause a lot of damage to Tyson. And how how isn't Fury like six eight, six nine? Yeah, six nine. And and yeah. you know if if Tyson Fury gets by Cunningham, especially in in a, a dominating way, I think we're going to see uh, Tyson Fury against David Hay. David Hay is already scheduled to fight in in June or July. And, um, you know, he, he's looking for his quick, fastest track to a Klitschko. And I think that if he fights uh, um, Tyson Fury and beats Fury, he will get that shot. And, and you know, I, I don't want to see David Hay. I can't stand David Hay, but I don't want to see him against anyone other than a Tyson Fury. I, I want to see him against somebody that's a legitimate uh, ranked fighter. Yeah, I would, you know, I don't want to see him against Klitschko only because I just don't want him to have another payday. I mean, we, he, he opened up his mouth, he got his shot at, at baby brother, and, you know, basically complained about his little pinky toe. I mean, I've never heard that before. I mean, it, it was a joke. <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, he went in there and, and just it was totally dominated by uh, baby Klitschko. Well, so I don't want him getting another payday. I don't think he deserves another payday. And if he does get to Tyson Fury and they do fight, I just hope Tyson just ends, ends David you know, David Hayes' career and just, you know, puts that to rest. Me too. And speaking of uh, complaints and, and another New York uh, uh, fight card, last week we got to see uh, uh, Guillermo Rigandau, in my opinion, put on one of the best performances I've seen in a long time uh, and beat Nonito Donaire, who's a media darling, and, and basically Donaire, uh, Donaire is coming up with more excuses. I think he could write a book with all the excuses of why he lost. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not knocking Nonito Donaire's talent, uh, Mikey, but the bottom line is I think he's I, – I said it yesterday on the show, on the Talking Box with Billy C show, that, you know, the best way I can look at him is like a spoiled kid, you know, like a, a spoiled, rotten kid, you know. that That's Nonito Donaire, and, and I'm kind of glad he lost. What's your thoughts on that fight? Well, I was uh, – I was well, first of all, I was very upset about all the excuses that he had, you know, my shoulder, my, my training – well, you know what? I heard, you know, stories that he was actually training by phone. Yeah, ridiculous. I mean, I, I, you got to be kidding me. You're a professional prize fighter. Yeah, okay. Your wife's pregnant. You have you expecting your first child? I think that's beautiful. Childbirth. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. You can be a dad. Yeah. So you know what? so what? You're a fighter. Right. Hey, yeah, but you know what I said too, Mike. You know, hey, let, let me ask you this. You know, if you're expecting a, a kid. You know, and and you're working, you're you're in your business. You know, a doctor's in his business. A a, a guy that works at the supermarkets in his business. What? Or, or everything stops, and and you hang out with your wife. You can't. You you're gonna do your job by phone. You know, come on, man. I mean, listen. I agree. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great experience, you know, especially if it's your first kid and all that th stuff. I I I'm I'm with it, but don't. <laughs> that has got to be the lamest excuse. And, and and to to put by far, arguably. The toughest fight of your career, you know, in jeopardy, and 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 it's not. It, this wasn't with some bozo trainer. This is uh, highly regarded Robert Garcia. You know that he that he's being trained. This is what I'm talking about. This is a guy that has that mentality that he doesn't need a trainer. He knows it all already. You know, all he needs is a trainer to give him water in the corner, and that is ridiculous. Remember, he fired his own father. He stabbed Gary Shaw in the back. He actually tried to stab uh, Top Rank in the back. He, he signed a deal with Golden Boy, but then Top Rank won in, in court. I mean, this is all that's happened with Donaire. You know, I'm glad he lost. Yeah, you know what? So am I uh, because of, like, all, all these things that have been coming out. And uh, um, uh, listen, bottom line is <laughs> – you're, you're, you're training, like you said, for the for one of the biggest fights of your life, and you know this guy's a, a quality opponent, 
And how could you just not go in 100% prepared? Yes. And you know what? As far as the fight itself, um, I could see how the casual boxing fan is going to look at this fight. Uh, you know, if someone who just watches, you know, uh, every you know highly pay per view fight, every, you know, every now and then, and look at this fight and say, eh, okay, it's pretty much a boring fight. But to a true boxing fan like yourself, myself, and others, um, it was a thing of beauty. I mean, you have to realize that he took quit basically the fighter of the year in 2012 and, and just made him look amateurish and he just took away every um you know weapon that he had that, that the left hook was just non-existent and he uh, you know some people say oh he was running i said he never ran he never ran he sometimes he would like reposition himself but the guy never ran it, it was just a thing of beauty it was old school uh you know the sweet science tactical fight if you will um, I thought it was, it, it was great to watch. Um, you know, if I was showing a fight to, to uh, you know, an up-and-coming boxing fan, you know, of course I'm going to show him fights like uh, Gotti Ward or just like a couple weeks ago uh, Alvarez and um, and and Brandon Rios, uh, which I'll, I want to get into a little bit. And, and then I would show them a fight like this and explain to them, uh, you know, when you could take away a, a, a great fighter's weapon and, and just make him look amateurish i mean that's just that's just a thing of beauty yeah i i agree with you um uh, rigandau uh, made uh, nunito donaire look ordinary at best and uh um you know i i also think you know we hear about that sweet science and hit and don't get hit you know we hear about that crap all the time when they refer to you know who the difference is i thought that rigandau the reason why it was exciting is because he wasn't just you know, rolling his head at it away a little bit and, and getting caught grazingly. This guy was moving his head side to side, up and down. His upper body was like a slinky. And then he was able to pivot on both feet, his right foot or his left foot, and be back in a position to counter punch with not one or two shots, but three or four. And yeah. and that is what I enjoyed. You know, he was, yes, he was defensive. Yes, he wasn't getting hit. But he was being aggressive when he had to be. yes. He could have been aggressive throughout, like he was in the first few rounds, and then that twelfth round was actually, in my opinion, uh, my favorite round of the fight. I, I thought that he uh, uh, totally dominated that round, and uh, then the weird thing with the with the eye and everything with Donaire, but nonetheless, uh, Rigandau is uh, uh, the best fighter in that division. And I know you wanted to touch a little on the uh, fight from the Alamo Dome uh, today. Um, it's uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez. Uh, going up against uh, Austin Trout. And uh, Saul Alvarez is, is a guy, number one, I'm giving him credit for this fight, Mikey, because his promoter and his management did not want him to fight Austin Trout. But he said, listen, if I'm if I'm calling myself the best junior middleweight, I got to fight this guy. And I applaud him for that. Although I'm not so sure it's going to come out the way he wanted. You know, I, I think if it goes to the scorecards, I think uh, Canelo is going to win, and and we may hear uh, uh, a lot of controversy over that. But uh, I I think that, uh, in my opinion, I, I think that that Saul Alvarez makes a couple of mistakes. Number one, he 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 likes to be right in front of his opponent when he, before he delivers punches. He does cut the ring off superbly. I will give him that. He he's 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 very proficient at cutting the ring off and putting himself in the in the position to land punches. But the other thing I notice about Alvarez is that when he delivers his punches, his knees kind of lock in a weird way, almost like if you you lock your knees and lean forward a little bit. And, and I think that the power, although a lot of people don't think he has power, but the power and the uh, punching ability, specifically the jab of Austin Trout, is going to uh, help him uh, win this fight. I, I, I'm picking Austin Trout in an upset. Well, yeah, I mean, Alvarez is heavily favored, which, number one, I just don't know why he's heavily favored. That's, But I'll get back to that. Uh, but let me let me say I, I echo your thoughts when you say that, uh, you know, you're happy that he stepped up and, and you applaud him for taking this fight. Yeah, they wanted him to fight Cotto. But why are you going to fight Cotto when Cotto just lost to this guy? And Cotto, what is, what is, who, what is Miguel Cotto? He's a blown up. Uh, 154 pounder. Well, let I mean, me ask you. Let, let me ask you. Basically a welterweight. Well, let me ask you a question, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but if if Saul Alvarez was fighting Cotto right now, mm -hmm. regardless of the fact that Austin Chow beat uh, Cotto, who would you pick in that fight? I would pick Alvarez. You would pick Two, Alvarez over Cotto? Yeah, 
Uh, absolutely. Two reasons. One, he's just a naturally bigger and, and, and he's and he's a younger kid. Um, I don't see Miguel hurting uh, Canelo. I mean, it, it's just a, it's just a size thing, basically. And, and, and listen, what war has Canelo been in? I was just going to say, who's he I, beat? I, I, I can give you a list of fights, uh, you know, wars that Cotto has been in. Yeah, but who's, I mean, who's Canelo beat? No, I'm not saying. Listen, I, this, this this is his toughest. As far as I'm concerned, uh, um, Trout is his toughest opponent to date. Of he's course, beaten, he's beaten grandfathers. He's beaten uh, you know, guys coming up to weight divisions. Three with I mean, it, it's been ridiculous. I know, I know. So, so this is this is a huge step up for him. This isn't a baby step. This isn't a, a progression step like a Cotto fight would have been. You know, and and I and I don't know if I agree with you uh, uh, about picking Alvarez over Cotto. I, I mean, I thought Cotto. Uh, fared well against uh, Mayweather. I, I, I don't think he won. I don't think he won any rounds even, but uh, uh, it was an entertaining fight. So, I mean, considering that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. What, what's your prediction in, in the Canelo-Trout fight? I like Trout, but, my you know, my biggest problem is is that where is the fight being take, is taking place? Oh, well, basically, basically Mexico. <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's just who's the referee? Lawrence Cole. He's the worst. And, then, and who, who's his father? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just it's, and I hear Texas. I hear, I, I think, Pernell Whitaker uh, versus Julio Cesar Chavez. I, I think uh, Juan Baby Bull Diaz versus Paul Malignaggi. I think uh, of the last uh, the Sergio Mora fight. It's just controversy after controversy after controversy, and it's going to be you know it's basically like you said it's Mexico. There's going to be ninety percent of the fans there are going to be rooting, um, you know, for Canelo. I mean, Trout has to put on a, a, a dazzling, no doubt Trout performance in order for him to win a decision. That's that's the problem. I, even if it's a fairly close fight, and I, I'm scoring it, I'm giving, I give Trout, you know, two, three extra rounds. It's not going to go that way. I, I just, I, I hate to say it, but I just, I fear Texas, right. and, and 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 they're scoring. Um, I don't think I don't think either fighter is going to knock uh, the other one out. Um, listen, there's no, uh, Trout is is without a doubt a, a, a I think a much b- better skilled boxer. Stick, move, defense. I mean, his defense compared to to Canelo's is 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 night and day. Uh, Canelo doesn't have a defense. Um, again, like we said, this is going to be a big step up for him. He's fought he's fought only like older older guys, and he's fought uh, less superior fighters, guys that have moved up. Uh, who, who, who who was it? Josito Lopez? Yeah, three weight two coach. weight division. Three. He actually had moved up one in his previous fight. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? I don't know. So uh, I'm just I'm just so happy to see that you know he insisted on this fight which kudos to him and he wants to be tested and he's going to be tested i think it's going to be a very entertaining fight i'm really looking forward to it um listen what i see and what the scorecards uh you know show at the end of the fight might be two different things but i i see trout uh outboxing canelo i see the early rounds going to Canelo, and I think when, when Trout gets into his rhythm, he's going to start to slow him down with that jab, stick and move, and he's going to take the, the, the later rounds. Um, that's how I see the fight going. How the judges see it, because it's in Texas, that's another story. Texas is crazy. I don't know if you know this, but Lawrence Cole and his father own the Cole Insurance Agency, which is one of the few companies in the in the world that's that um ensure boxing events so you'll always notice that they're very quick to stop a fight in texas when there's a cut <laughs> you know they don't want to pay out on nothing you know so uh not to mention that lawrence cole is the worst uh referee one of the worst v- referees uh in the sport and uh having his dad uh being the commissioner of boxing in texas i mean uh talk about uh, uh being uh unfair um I wouldn't be surprised if Trout knocks out um, Saul. I, I mean, I know I'm the only one thinking that because everybody thinks uh, no doubt has no power. But uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if uh, he has his way with him, stuns him, and finishes him off. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, before we get into Major League Baseball, you, you said you wanted to touch on the uh, Bam Bam Rios and Mike Alvarado fight. Yeah, I thought that was just... Uh... Uh, an excellent, excellent fight. I, I was telling uh, friends of mine who were going to watch it. I, I said, "Listen, basically, what this fight comes down to is is um, is if 
Mike Alvarez sticks to his game plan, which is to box and, and don't go toe to toe constantly. I mean, there are times you, you know you pick your spots and you're gonna you're gonna brawl, you're gonna bang a little bit, and you're gonna uh, you're gonna give what you take. But for the most part, he, I I thought he would he would should have won the first fight. I thought it was an early stoppage, um, and I thought if he if he would have just boxed in the first fight. I, you know, I think he would have beaten uh, Bam Bam Rios. He stuck to his game plan, and I'm, I'm just really happy to see that uh, that he got the decision. What's your thoughts on uh, the rumor mill that it looks like it's almost uh, signed, sealed, and delivered that Mike Alvarado will be fighting Manny Pacquiao next in October? Uh, it should be a fun, entertaining fight. You know, um, I think Manny, being the uh, smaller guy. Um, you know, he's got to watch out for Mike. I mean, Mike is a, he, he's a tough SOB. Uh, he could take some punishment. Um, yeah, listen, I mean, who, who else is Manny going to fight? We're going to see Manny and Marquez five. I personally rather see Marquez fight Bradley, you know, at this point, I don't want to see Manny Marquez five. I didn't want to see Manny Marquez four. Um, but it should be an entertaining fight. I hope, I hope they do sign it. You know, I'll, I'll definitely be watching that. Um, what's your thoughts about that? About Pacquiao Alvarado? Yeah. Um, I uh, I like it. I, I think Pacquiao uh, doesn't have anything else to prove, but, uh, you know, like what he's done most of his career. I mean, he goes for, for big names. He goes for big fighters. I, you know, Alvarado's a dangerous opponent, you know. Uh, I, I don't see Floyd going after a guy like Alvarado or Rios or Timothy Bradley or any of those guys, you know, so... Um, I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Well, again, with that fight, what I, what I know is, you know, should happen. You know, you're going to see a lot of toe to toe. You're going to see you're going to see somebody getting knocked out or knocked down or TKO'd. I mean, you're going to see a very entertaining fight because of those two styles. Oh, so yeah. that's that's something that I'm excited about. You know, the funny thing about uh, Manny Pacquiao, everybody wants him to retire and everything else. He was winning that fight against Juan Manuel Marquez. I mean, he got caught and was devastatingly knocked out, but. Uh, for the most part, it was the old Manny Pacquiao up until that point. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see which Manny Pacquiao comes out. If he's going to be fighting cautiously, if he goes back to the way he looked like he was fighting against Juan Manuel Marquez. So I'm looking forward to seeing Manny again. But uh, we got the uh, the big fight uh, coming up in a week or so. Uh, Floyd Mayweather uh, going up against uh, Robert Agos Guerrero. And Robert Agos Guerrero kind of has a New York uh, connection. Uh, the guy gets busted in a New York airport, Mike, um, which I, I couldn't wait to talk to you about. I mean, listen, you know, I, I understand that it was a total mistake, and, and it wasn't like he was trying to smuggle the gun on, on board or anything, but New York has made, you know, they've made no qualms about bragging about how strict the gun laws are in the sports industry alone. We got to see Plexico Burris shoot himself in the leg at a nightclub and then watch the, uh, the, the New York uh, use him as an example and, and sure as hell, regardless of a Super Bowl win, uh, send him into the slammer for 18 months. Um, what's your thoughts on Robert Agos Guerrero? And in lieu of how this all transpired, much differently than, uh, than Plexico Burris, do you think that they're going to throw this one out or do you think they're going to make this guy do some time? I don't see how they throw it out. I mean, you see how they how strict they are. You you, you see what uh, you know Bloomberg. I mean, well, he sent the message. Yeah, but uh, but, but, yeah, but Barres Barres had the gun. First of all, Barres had the gun. It was loaded, and he shot himself in the leg. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, it's it's comical. <laughs> you know, I could just picture the whole scene. You know, he's yeah you know, hooting and ah, dancing it up with with the ladies, and all of a sudden hits his uh, hand on his leg and shoots himself. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, ridiculous. Okay. But but in Robert Agos Guerrero's case, I'm not sure if you you know the story, but what happened yeah, was, do. yeah, he boards a plane. He's training in Vegas, so he gets on a plane, and he follows the protocol. He walks up to the counter in Vegas and says, here's my gun. There's no bullets. The magazine is separate. It's in a case. I'm right. checking it with you, and they put it in the, with the luggage. So when he gets, he lands in New York, he goes to the luggage claim, picks up his, his gun, no problem. He walks out of the building. They, we went. He's in New York for, for that week. And uh, when he gets back on the plane, he went through the same procedure. He walks up to the, to the uh, ticket counter to check his baggage, and he says, by the way, this is a gun. I'm reporting it. It's not loaded. It's not this, not that. Next thing you know, he's in handcuffs. You know, so it's not like he tried to smuggle it on. 
I have a feeling they're going to throw this one out. Uh, you think they're not, huh? Well, I, I think uh, – no, I don't think they're going to throw it out. I, I really don't. I think uh, they're going to – Okay, maybe he's not going to get two and a half years like Plexico Burris got. Obviously, he said it was a little different. He had the loaded gun. It was it went off and shoots himself <laughs> in the leg. Um, it, this is just basically stupidity, not only on Robert's part, but on all of his handlers. I mean, you're, you're traveling from state to state. You need, and if you're a, a, a gun owner, which which I am, I, I know what the laws are. I know where I can drive. I know I can go to South Carolina. I know I can go to Georgia. I know where I can go with my firearm, and 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 they honor it. They honor my my permit. I know I can't go to New York. Now, I got a friend of mine. He, he he travels down every Christmas, and he goes from New York. He drives down to my house. He stays over, uh, and then from there he goes to Florida, and he he drops off his pistol here. He leaves it here. For me, and he continues his trip to New York. He, he knows the rules. You have to know the rules when it comes to a firearm. So this is just mind-boggling. And if you remember, just a few months prior, there's a, the Tampa Bay Buccaneer defensive end. Same thing. He went in and said, oh, by the way, I have a gun. Are you kidding me? How do you not know the rules of, 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 of New York, especially New York City, with firearms? I can't see them just throwing it out. Uh, you know, maybe he's going to get, uh, I, I don't know, two months jail. I don't know what he's going to get. But they're not just going to. They're not going to say, "Ah, oh, we forget about it." I can't see that happening. You, you think that he's going to do time? Then you think he's going to do some kind of uh, in jail? Uh, you know, um, whatever. Behind bars. I yeah. mean, listen. If 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 they can do it, they will. I don't think they're going to say, "Oh, well, you know what." He's the champion, and uh, you know, you, you know, then it's it's not going to play into a, a effect. I mean, you got a guy like I said. With, I mean, know Burris's case was a little different, but you know what? <laughs> the guy just won a Super Bowl for you. I know, and and <laughs> you're like, and, and you're totally <laughs> right. You're totally right with Bloomberg. I mean, it, this is this is perfect for him to yeah, say this is care. what. Yeah, this is what he says. He, he's like, I don't care. If you're coming into this state with an un, unloaded gun with no bullets. If it's not registered, you're going to jail. You know, I, 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 I listen. It's going to be curious to see, um, but uh, it is after the big fight, and he is taking on Floyd Mayweather. And a lot of people wonder how this is going to affect uh, Robert Dugos Guerrero. Uh, you know, I think he's one of mentally. I think he's one aside from making stupid decisions. Um, I think he's mentally sound. You know, this guy to be able to continue his career with with his uh, beautiful wife uh, having. Uh, cancer and him raising the kids and all of that stuff that they went through, um, you know, ultimately fighting uh, many b people who believe is a pound for pound best fighter in the world today. Um, I, I, with all that said, you know, I like the fight. I, I give Floyd a lot of credit, actually, for fighting uh, uh, Guerrero. And, and I'm convinced, Mike, that Robert Dugos Guerrero is going to perform a lot better, if not m make the upset of the century, um, you know, than people think. You know, I, I, a long time ago when you and I have talked about this fight, I says I can't see uh, Guerrero winning this fight. And you, you, you've been saying nay-nay for the whole time. And then you even said that you'd be shocked if, if Mayweather chose Guerrero as his next opponent. You thought he would steer clear of Guerrero because you thought he gave him the tougher challenge as opposed to, let's say, Canelo Alvarez, who's actually uh, a bigger opponent because he's a natural 154-pounder. So he goes and he, he, he chooses uh, um, Guerrero, and, and, and you give him all the credit in the world. And you know what? I look at it now. I still don't think he's going to win, but I, I do think he's going to give him a tough fight. Um, you, if you watch the Cotto fight, Floyd got hit more in that fight than he's ever gotten hit before, and now he, he's just older. And as you know, the first thing that goes is, is the legs. And Guerrero is, is going to be hungry. He's going to be forceful. He's going to be in the guy's face. He's going to make it a tough fight. He's going to he's going to do what you know you started to see Victor Ortiz do before the stupid headbutt, and that's get aggressive, stay in the guy's face. But you know what? When Guerrero, who is a much more skilled fighter, in my opinion, than a guy like Victor Ortiz, he gets in your face. He's going to do it um, with effective aggressiveness 
as opposed to just being wild and stupid like Victor was. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, you know, you hear Floyd say it all the time: forty-three people have gone in with, with uh, game plans and forty-three have failed, which is true. You have to give the guy credit. Um, I, I don't know, you know, what his plan is. If it's a body attack, is it, uh, you know, use his? I think he's got a longer reach. He's a little bit taller uh, than than uh, Mayweather to try. I don't know what his thought is right now because he's being very hush hush about it. But I, I do think. Um, it's definitely more entertaining than the Cotto fight, and, and in that fight, like I said, Mayweather got hit with a lot of shots, and you saw an aging boxer that's just starting to age. So uh, it's going to be very interesting. I just, I, I still think Floyd has enough to eke out a, a, a decision victory, but you know, I, I could change my mind in a week or so. But we'll see. A couple of things. Number one, Floyd has a tendency to beat his opponent before the first bell sounds. Mike Tyson used to, you know, he's scared to death. His opponents were scared to death to, to fight Mike Tyson. I'll never forget, you know, Michael Spinks was, was petrified. They, they had to drag him out to the ring, and ultimately he just waited for that knockout punch, and, and he lost in 30-something seconds. Sonny Liston used to scare his opponents to death. They were scared to fight him, and, and that helped him when the bell rang. Mayweather, he beats his opponents in a different way. I don't think anybody on the planet is scared of Mayweather, right. although although he tries to make it, him seem like he's a real badass and stuff. You know, he's a thug. He's a punk to me, you know. But he gets in their heads. And, you know, it's not working with Guerrero. And I think that that's going to work for Guerrero. And, and Mayweather's going to start doubting himself. Oh, man, you know, th this could very well be the first guy that, you know, Mayweather hasn't gotten into his head in all this pre-fight stuff. That's number one. You know, number two, you know, Floyd is working with Papa Floyd now. You know, uh, Roger Mayweather is, is, is very ill and uh, is not uh, working with, with, uh, with Floyd Jr. So he, he's going to his father, who we all know has had, uh, you know, up and down relationships, to, to put it mildly. The one thing that came out in the news last week was that you know Floyd wanted to uh, finish up his uh, his workout session with some push-ups and sit-ups and you know some calisthenics and stuff like that? And Papa Floyd said, "Nah, you've done enough. You know, older fighters have to be wiser fighters in the ring. You know, don't uh, you overtrain for the Cotto fight? That's why you didn't look as good uh, as you're gonna for this fight." And sent him home. And, and I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. You know, yeah. and and I wonder about that, Mikey. You know, I, I say to myself, you know. You know, whether whether you want to make an excuse for not looking as good as you wanted to and you're you're not, you know, taking in consideration that you're 36 years old, if that's the part you're not believing and you want to blame it on training, now's not the time against a guy like Robert Agos Guerrero to cut corners on training. And I know you could look at it two different ways. But I was you know, just going to say, can't you look at it the other way where, where actually Floyd Sr. might have something? He might say, yeah, you did overtrain for the Cotto fight. And, and you should use your head – rest rest the body a little more instead of pushing the body at 36 years old. You could look at it that way. What about the mental aspect? What if Floyd feels that, you know, by doing those 20, 30, 50, 100 – I don't know how many friggin' push-ups and sit-ups he does. But by doing that, that gives him the edge. You know the old saying, Muhammad Ali, you know, says, uh, you know, hey, I run in the rain. I run in the snow. I look across the ring. You know, did he run in the rain? Did he wake up that morning and run in the rain when it was terrible weather out? You know, he knows he did. It's just a mental uh, something that, you know, something mentally that, that you gain. It's, it's a, you know, it's an edge, you know. And, and considering what I just said, where Robert Goes Guerrero is not really falling prey to some of the, the mental attacks that Floyd is launching on him, now all of a sudden Floyd might be doubting that part of his game and maybe his own strength because he's been cutting a couple of corners. Well, here's, here's the thing. We saw Floyd senior you know tell him eh, you know i don't want you to do push-up sit-ups right now but we also know that floyd jr marches to the beat of his own drum so you know after he took those gloves off and he went home if he wanted to do push-ups and sit-ups you really think he'd give a crap what his father says he's no. gonna do what he wants to do so i don't think listen maybe floyd senior said let's let's you know let's rest the body and and, and exercise the mind but Junior's going to do what Junior wants to do. So if he wants to go home to his mansion and, and go in his private gym and do a thousand sit-ups and a thousand push-ups, that's what Junior's going to do. So I don't, I don't think that one decision by by Senior is really going to uh, affect him. 
No. And, and as far as getting into, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but as far as getting into Guerrero's head, no, I think Guerrero is pretty sound minded. I, I, I'm, I'm sure he's very confident going into this fight. But I, there were a lot of fighters confident. I mean, I, I, De La Hoya was confident. Cota was confident. There were a lot of fighters that were confident going in. And as far as like what you said about fighters beating fighters before they get into the ring, yeah, a Tyson, you know, scared the pants off of people. Uh, Sonny Liston, you know, years before did the same thing. I think with, with Floyd, it's just the mystique of, you know, when he tells Guerrero, look, 43 guys have all had game plans, but 43 guys didn't succeed. That can get into a fighter's head. And no. you don't know. I mean, I don't think Guerrero is scared as just as much as you do. He's not. But the fact that, well, what could I do differently to beat this guy that 43 guys have tried to do and they couldn't do that 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 would get into my head more than you know stepping into a ring with a guy like like a Tyson or a Sonny Liston because for me personally I'm not scared I'm not scared of, of getting hit I've been in a ring before but if someone is undefeated and now all these guys you know made an attempt what what am I going to do differently you know am I going to if I going to am I going to try to be aggressive or am I gonna am I gonna try to outbox him? Mean, wh- what do I do? Wow. That's 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 the problem that Guerrero is facing right now in his head, and we don't see it on camera, or we don't hear it in interviews. But you got to be thinking about that. Well, I, I, first of all, you, I think you hit on a very important aspect of Floyd Mayweather when you said if Floyd wants to, if Floyd beats to his own drum was your exact words, and you said that if Floyd goes home and wants to do a thousand push-ups and a thousand sit-ups, Floyd's going to do it. And, and that's going to be Floyd's undoing, and I'll tell you why. If he gets in trouble in a fight, whether it's this fight, the next fight, or whatever, um, and he goes back to his corner, you're going to see Andro, Andre Berto-like chaos in Floyd Mayweather's corner. That's my prediction. We've never seen it. And, and I don't think that Floyd will listen to anyone, and that will be his unraveling. You watch. That'll happen. Now, now uh, it, when and if it happens is is yet to be seen but i i think that someday it will happen now going back to the robert de guerrero thing uh and the uh the mental aspect you know 43 people have done it before they they failed um you know i, I look at it this way nobody's really went into the ring against floyd with zero respect for floyd they're they're over respecting him that's part of the mental mystique that's what floyd beats you with his you know that you're 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 nervous about those 43 guys that that couldn't do it, you know, and, and, and it's over-respect. And consider this, Mike. Consider the fact that when Floyd picks an opponent, it's in a sense that you're winning a lottery ticket. You know, you're, you just won a lottery. You, you just were chosen to, to make the biggest payday of your life. You're, you're, right. you're, you're, you're going to set your family up and probably your kids' families for the rest of their lives, something that, that you or I could only dream about. If I run into a, a, a lamp with a genie in it, maybe I'm going to have enough money, you know? So, right. so I mean, you know, and, and I'm convinced be, because of human nature. Listen, no one hates Floyd Mayweather more than me, but if Floyd Mayweather sent me a check for a million dollars, how could I hate on this guy? How could I? Po- it's a human nature. As much as I can't stand him, if he sent me a check and said, here, this is for everything you do in the sport, how could I hate on this guy ever again? I couldn't. You know, and it's the same mentality, at least in my opinion, of a fighter who just signed for 10 or 20 million, God knows what they're going to make, and now he's facing that guy that just set him up for his life, his kid's life, and so on and so forth. How are you going to beat the crap out of this guy? It, it, oh, very easily. No, very but, easily. but you're what you oh, said, But what you said, you said if Floyd sent me a check, that doesn't mean you're getting into the ring with the guy. Yeah, if he sent me a check too, uh, I might be a Floyd Mayweather fan. Send me a million dollars. But if you if you, if you tell me, he says, listen, you want to fight Floyd for a million dollars, I'm I'm gonna give everything I can to knock this guy out. So I yeah, I think there's a difference. Yeah, I don't but you think are it's because Guerrero signed a big contract. He's, yeah, but, oh, but what a guy. All right, he forget give it. A crap about Floyd. All right, forget it. Let's say he don't send it to you. Let's say they offer me a million dollars to go to see if I could go three minutes with Floyd. You know, right. I, the bottom line is this. Yeah, I'm going to try to go three minutes, but you know what? I, I'm not going to kill myself in there. I, you know, I'm just thankful for the million dollars. I don't know. Yeah, but you're not a fighter. You're not, you're not, a, you're not a professional fighter. And we, like we just talked about this before with, with, with Donaire, right? You, that's your job. That's Guerrero's job. I don't think – I, I, I just totally disagree. I don't think the money aspect has anything 
to do with with Guerrero's uh, mental state. I don't think he's saying, "Wow, what a guy, Floyd! I signed a big contract. I hit the lottery. I can retire." No way, man. He wants to make history. He wants to be that 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 forty fourth guy that that knocks this guy off the pedestal. And let's let's not forget one more thing. Look look at his lifestyle, meaning Guerrero's compared to Floyd's lifestyle. <clears throat> Guerrero is a family man. Gun toting, he's a he's a god he's he's a gun toting, god fearing man. (laughs) Absolutely, and 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 you think he likes a guy like this? No, who 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 supposedly you know got you know two million uh, followers on Twitter and and and, and, uh, this this is a role model. This is not a role model. It's a piece of garbage in in Guerrero's eyes. Listen, he's he's a piece of garbage in my eyes, but uh, a lot of people's eyes. Yeah, I I mean, I mean, you're hitting hitting your 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 ex wife's baby mama, and you're pushing your kids back, and your your bodyguards, and you're doing jail time. I I can't. If 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 Guerrero got paid fifty million dollars for this fight, he'd still want to go in there and knock this guy's head off. I hope so. I hope so, and uh, we'll see in a couple of weeks. And hey, you know, if you got some time, we're doing a Billy C. a uh, fight week, uh, which uh, originally I was supposed to go to uh, Las Vegas, but uh, the fight now uh, TV channel kind of stabbed me in the back. So I'm going to be doing it uh, right here from uh, from our studio here, and I'd love to have you come on. It, it, we are going to be doing it every day, uh, beginning uh, April 29th. So it's going to be every single day for an hour or so, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So if you got some time, uh, call in, man. I'd love to love to get you on the show, man. You know, actually, you said that after April 29th, I will have some time. Because uh, I don't start Homeland season three until probably mid-May. Great. Well, so I should have some time after the 29th. Well, let's uh, let's chat. I, I should have a new phone in place uh, so you can call me uh, tomorrow. So uh, uh, anyway, let's talk a little baseball, man. First, uh, we'll get the scum Yankees out of the way. Uh, unfortunately uh, uh, for the Yankees, uh, actually one of my favorite Yankees, really. I, I got to give him uh, all the credit in the world, Derek Jeter. Um, is out, you know, he's out for a while and, uh, uh, you know, uh, he really gave it his all. He wanted to come back from that, uh, uh, surgery. What's your thoughts on that and how will it affect the team, uh, as time goes on? Well, I really don't think it's going to affect the team. You know, uh, this, you know, the professionals are going to play ball. You're going to have Nunez just playing more time at, uh, at shortstop. And even if, if, if Derek was approved to come back, I mean, listen, the guy's gonna be 39 years old in, in, uh, in June, I mean, you don't know if he has he's lost a step in the, in the out in, in, in at his position. Uh, there's a lot of uh, X factors involved here that we just don't know about. So I, I think the Yankees will be fine, as you can see. Um, they're playing they're playing good baseball. Um, they're hitting okay. I mean, uh, I, I don't think Jeter's going to come in with a 335 batting average. Um, I, I think they'll, they'll they'll you know they'll weather this storm. Um, and and when he does come back after uh, <clears throat> after uh, the All Star break, you know, listen, we, we'll see how effective he could be at 39 years old. We we just we just don't know. Um, uh, I'm surprised that they're doing this well, to be honest with you. So I mean, he's a team that you know everybody said uh, out of the 200 and plus home runs uh, that they lost because of injury or 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 you know they signed to free agency, uh, you know, they left for other teams. This team, is, you know, is still uh, what they ranked what, third in home runs, fourth in home runs, or twenty-five. I mean, it's still the Bronx Bombers. I mean, it's like you didn't—they didn't lose a beat. Yeah, uh, that's right. They're they ranked third, twenty-five home runs. I mean, go figure. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we were all uh, hoping and wishing that uh, they were going to be in the cellar, but the season's still early. I got to give Pettit a, a lot of credit. He's three and zero. And uh, I would have never thought it. I, I you know, I, I, I said a million times, I, I thought it was a mistake uh, bringing him on. And, and again, it's early. He's traditionally a second half uh, of the season pitcher. Um, I think it's kind of, uh, especially now at this point of his career, strange to see him now. I, I just don't know if he's going to hold up. But my big question mark, forget the Yankees, is what about Toronto, man? They spent all that money, and so far they haven't really – lived up to the hype and and you can't say well they need time to gel because they they basically took that all-star team from from the marlins and it's just not doing well i you know could it be the the the, the place that they're playing toronto i mean that's got to be you know the russian front so to speak of of baseball when you get sent to that team well i mean they're like the miami marlins of the north um you know listen again excuse me it, it's early um, Reyes is having a, a you know a fast start until he got injured. 
and and we, we we've said all along that you know playing on that artificial turf uh, every uh, every home game it's gonna it's gonna affect that guy's legs. So uh, they're seven and ten, and uh, you know they're not playing that well at home. They're below five hundred at home, but again it, it's it's early. I don't think they're gonna finish uh, you know last like the um, um, Miami Marlins did after they did all those free agency signings. I think they're an okay team. I think they'll come around. It this isn't that's a tough division. How is it? What do you? A, a, what's what, that? What do you think of Boston jumping out in front? I'm not playing? surprised. I'm not surprised. As a matter of fact, I, I said that you know once they got rid of. Listen, Bobby Valentine was just a cancer for that for that organization. I know you and I are both fans of Valentine, and but he just. He was a cancer for that organization, and then I was, and they got rid of him, and they got rid of a lot of dead weight. That was, uh, you know, you know, their their, their contracts uh, was just an astronomical amount of money that they got rid of, and they just dumped it all on the Dodgers. And and, and look at them, and look at the Dodgers. And Dodgers are below 500 team, and, and uh, Boston's in first place. I mean, listen, it's not about all that money. It's it's getting ball players, and they you know, pick up a guy like Napoli. That's a ball player, right? And, you know, and I don't know. Uh, if, I don't know if Bobby V should take. I, I still don't blame it on him. You know, he he was surrounded by, you know, you 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 refer to him as a cancer. I, I think he was surrounded by cancerous players. You know, well, he was and, a cancer on that team. I'm not right. saying he's a cancerous coach uh, I, or I manager. Uh, I liked him when he was with the Mets. I really did. I know. I never had a problem with Bob. I'm a fan of Bobby Valentine. He's a, I think he's a great, a great manager. You know, and uh, it's just that he just didn't gel there. And yeah, and and, and listen, I'm not. Saying the players had nothing to do with it. I mean, they're a bunch of spoiled crybaby brats, and they did go from Terry Francona, who was like, you know, you want to, you know, drink beer in the clubhouse, you want to do what you want to do. I mean, basically, the the inmates ran the asylum. Right. Uh, at, at the last year that Terry was there, and that didn't work. I mean, he basically lost control of the team. Then you bring in a guy like like Bobby, who was just a control freak. So yeah, there's going to be problems. You know, you got to have a, a little bit of both. And um, that, you know that's what they have now, and uh, I'm not surprised. I said they're going to be an. I said they're definitely going to be an improved team from what they had last year, and they are. And this team is not really even hitting that well right now. It's all pitching. I mean, they're they're getting some excellent. They got a good bullpen. Of Buckholtz and and Lester are, 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 are lights out right now. So and they got rid of Beckett. They're they're doing this basically with with uh, pitching, because a lot of their guys just haven't hit yet. You know, they got this this rookie uh, Bradley, highly touted Bradley Junior. And yeah, you know, he, he's not even hitting a hundred. I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not surprised. I, and I think when those bats start to warm up, um, they're going to be a tough team to uh, to beat in that division. Pitching, pitching, pitching. It's what baseball is all about. And uh, yep. you know, it, it's funny. Uh, you know, as I put together notes and prepare for this show. Um, I was going back, you know, and I had been preparing for shows that you and I were going to do, uh, um, you know, before today. And one of the things that was a, a hot topic at the time was the Santana, the Johan Santana situation for the Mets when he was all pissed off in, in training camp. You know, that, uh, you know, he was he was mad that the Mets weren't letting him do this and do that. And then a week later, they find out that, uh, you know, he's not even going to be playing this year. You know, uh, uh, his injury sent them back down. Uh, I think we've seen the last of Johan Santana, Santana on the Mets, possibly in baseball. What's your thoughts? Yeah, definitely on, on, on the Mets. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, why would you bring this guy back in August or September? I mean, it's... They still owe him the money, though. They've got to pay him, right? No, they're definitely going to pay him. I mean, they're still paying Bobby Bonilla for crying out loud. I mean, it's ridiculous. Are they really? Contracts. Are they What's really? That? Are they really still paying Bobby Bonilla? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that you could you could check this. Uh, you could do the research on it, but I believe when he left the Mets, they it was a twenty five year, uh, one million a year for the next twenty five years. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> if he makes, I, if he makes a million dollars a year from the Mets. I, who even knows what he's doing right now? Who cares? Good, well, good, yeah, good. But don't you figure that plus his his pension? You know, you know, obviously a baseball pension is gonna is going you know exceed a, a working man's blue collar pension. So he's probably making probably two million dollars a year doing absolutely nothing. More power Doesn't to him. Doesn't have to do a thing. More power to him. You know, I mean, uh, you know what? That's stupidity on the Mets' part. And, and of course it is. Same thing's going to happen with, what's his name, A-Rod, you know, uh, so you watch. Unless unless 
they uh, I, the Yankees are hoping that they implicate him 100 percent without a doubt. Then they don't have to pay him with that uh, new steroid thing. So, um, but uh, let's go back to the Mets. They're a game over 500, which actually I'm a little surprised at. Um, I'm happy and talk about undefeated. Matt Harvey has blown away uh, my expectations for him out of the gate. He's four and zero. Uh, he's under a one ERA. He's got point nine three, which actually went up. Uh, yeah, from, go uh, figure. He pitched uh, <laughs> seven solid innings last night. Gave up one run. His ERA went up. I know. And uh, and his first hit uh, is Strasburg, the the guy yeah. who he's going up against. You know, which was uh, amazing. Um, but you know, my my question is: Listen, we we both knew Matt Harvey was a stud. We 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 both knew it. We were psyched about him coming on and everything else. Here's my million dollar question. And you, you said this last year in, in not so many uh, words, and, and this was your concern about Matt Harvey uh, and Wheeler. I'll get to him in a second. But, uh, but Matt Harvey, one of the knocks on Matt Harvey is that he was a one-dimensional pitcher. He has heat. We all know he can, he can uh, get into the high 90s, and he displayed that last night. Are the teams going to catch up to him? Is this a pitcher that if he doesn't develop uh, some other pitches in his arsenal – um, is this going to be a guy that you know starts out at the gate the way he has been? Then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're going to see uh, hitters just uh, you know hitting batting practice off him. No, not at all. Number one, I didn't say that about Harvey. I said that about Purnell. Purnell was one dimensional, and his fastball is as straight as an arrow. That's the guy I have a concern about. Harvey has four pitches, and Harvey throws all four pitches for strikes. On top of that. When you have a 99 mile an hour fastball with movement, this guy is amazing. This guy is a, he's a, and he's not afraid. I mean, last night, if I watched the game last night, yeah, bases loaded, nobody out. Yeah. He got three outs in a row, the ball never left the infield. Yeah. I mean, the guy is just, he's just, you know, come get me. He is fearless. I mean, and you hear him in interviews, he doesn't sound like a 24 year, 24 year old rookie. Yeah, I know he came up last year, pitched a few games, but this is basically his rookie season. And he has just been lights out. But Matt Harvey is is becoming must see TV. It's the, okay. only, it's, it's the only guy that's drawn the Mets fans to to City Field. I mean, they had almost thirty thousand there last night, and uh, he's, he is the Doc Gooden. Yes, uh, of, of 2013. Well, they got to sign him. I, I mean, uh, you know, they got to sign him long term quickly. Oh, they got to. They got to. You know, I, I mean, there's no they, way you can't lose this guy. They have to. They have to do that with him, and they're going to do it with Wheeler. I well, mean, Wheeler, this is what Sandy has talked about. This is the future. They're going to set. They're going to give contracts to these guys. They, they, you know, Santana's contract is coming off the books. That's 25 plus million. Um, this is what they're saving their money for, guys like this to keep these guys locked up for another five to six, seven years. They got to go that route. Mikey, because you know when you look at you mentioned Doc Gooden. When you look at the, those teams of the eighties, uh, you know the the, the Cinderella teams, uh, uh, obviously of uh, prior to that. But you know the pitching is the nucleus of the team. Yeah, you have a couple of studs in in on the play in the infield or the outfield, whatever uh, that can hit the ball. But those guys you can bring in for a year here and there. The pitching. It's proven over the last 20 years in base. Actually, over the whole history of the sport of baseball, you need solid pitching. You got a good young group of guys coming up. The Mets have to solidify them. You know, I thought that the Mets made a mistake when they got rid of Cashmere, and then they actually had an opportunity. The guy was playing. I, I think he made the starting rotation in Cleveland. I believe it's Cleveland. Uh, they signed him to a minor league contract. You know why not? You know a, a team that was starving for pitching. The guy they they destroyed. They sent him back to to the minors. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the 172 year old pitcher that they destroyed. He went to the Feliciano. Feliciano. He, yeah, yeah, he's back to the minors. Um, you know, so I mean, they still need uh, pitching. The bullpen is still questionable. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, Zach Wheeler. He got roughed up a little bit yesterday. Um, in uh, he's playing for the Las Vegas Triple A team, although they won ten to five. He he only pitched one and one third inning, um, you know, and he got four earned runs in there. Uh, you know, he's uh, he threw a lot of pitches. As a matter of fact, he threw the most pitches he has all season so far, one hundred and eight. Um, I still think that they need to get this guy up here as quickly as possible. Are, do you think that he's going to be in Triple A all year? Do you think? I know at one point you thought they would be bringing him up in the second half of the year. I mean, what's the future for Zach Wheeler for this season? 
I still think it's going to be a second half of the season. It, it, it all comes down to finances, and, and uh, you know, if he stays down in the minor for whatever time it is, it's you know, 20 games, 20 days, whatever it is, um, then they'll bring him up. He will be up here June, July, whatever it is. They're just not going to – number one, he hasn't been lights out down there like you said. No, he hasn't. So, I mean, so, you know, let him get some work. And, 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 you know, from the Mets' point of view, as far as, you know, you're talking about signing these guys, well, you get them for an extra year if he stays down there at for such a period of time. So if he's down there for X amount of days, then he's under contract with the Mets for an extra year or something like that. They have control over him. So that's what they do. And they're doing the same thing with Travis, you know, to know the catcher who, unfortunately, this guy just can't stay healthy. Well, what? Yeah, yeah, but but when do you change plans? If 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 all of a sudden you start to see that your team is competitive, I mean, you know, yeah, it's early well, on. I don't I don't see I, I don't see us being competitive. We're we're eight and seven. All right, and, but, and, and but we're, we're chasing still on... probably the, you know the, the the two best teams in in baseball, which is going to be the National and look at the Braves, that thirteen and three. Okay, but so, but 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 look at the you know uh, the the second team that you know you're talking about the Nationals. They're four games out. We're four and a half, you know. So, I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about um, – I know it's early in the season, but, you know, the, uh, last year, I mean, Baltimore jumped out to a, to a big uh, lead early and, and never looked back, you know. So, I, I, you know, yeah. hey, listen, they are professionals. We, 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 we joked about them and we were sick to our stomachs and we can complain all we want still. But the truth of the matter is, is they're all pro ball players, and you know if nobody's giving them a chance, maybe they sneak up on somebody. I mean, when do you make that decision that, you know, forget looking forward to twenty fourteen? We're we're in a season right now that we could be competitive in. Uh, I don't know if we could be competitive the whole season with the outfield that we have. I mean, there are just a lot of holes in in our in our uh, in your our boy, team. Your uh, idol. Right now, you... right now, listen, we started off last year, you know, like a house on fire. And, and look what happened after the All Star yeah, break. Yeah, because of you with the All Star break. Yeah, it's if you if, for the rest of my if life. you it's give me. a prediction this year, if they're in it and you say anything, I, as a matter of fact, we're not even doing a show that week. You know, just <laughs> but uh, well, how about here, Duda? Here's what I think. See, what happened last year is that they should have made uh, moves before the All Star break. Why do you always have to wait and after and see what they do? You know, two weeks after the All Star break because they just consistently they play bad after the all-star break so if they're up by five games at at, at mid-season then you know what let's make moves before this time let's try a little something different because because at the all-star by the all-star break they're going to bring up wheeler they're going to bring up travis denode and uh, you know these are the future of, of the new york mets and then you got to add somebody there's been talk about you know carlos gonzalez they've been talking about the uh, Giancarlo Stanton, uh, you know, you got to trade for something. We need a, you need at least one solid stud in the outfield. I mean, I want to hear about Lucas Duda. He hit a home you know, run. He, he, he got, got a home runs run. last night. Two. I don't hear about that crap. He got two it, home runs last night. Duda. Right, but, yeah, but you know what? Duda, These are not Duda, everyday Duda. ball Duda. players. Come on. <laughs> They're not everyday ball players. And, and, and listen, I, I'm so I, I, I'm not an Ike Davis fan. I gotta come out and say it right now. I'm not an Ike Davis fan. Ike Davis to me is Dave Kingman. That's it. He reminds me uh, how about, of Dave Kingman. I'm not a big Murphy fan either. Mur Murphy looks well, like look, Herm look at Murphy's always a 300 hitter. Yeah, but he looks like Herman Munster playing second base. I mean, uh, you know, he's just. He's, you see the play he made last night? Listen, he's not. He's not a detriment at second base as, as much as he used to be. He's definitely improved at his position. But how do you get rid of a guy who's batting three fifty? You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. And, and, I, he's, and he's added a little bit of pop to his bat. Well, I, you know what? Um, they just can't play in the snow, which you can't blame them. But uh, <laughs> nobody could play in the snow. But you know what? Somebody's got to win. So why is why is Colorado winning three in a row in the snow? I mean, come on. Because they're smoking I mean, weed. One, one of those games, the bullpen just imploded. That's the problem. Is the bullpen? I know. I know. You know. But... Let me let me go, go back to hitting. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw a stat at you right now. Okay, the first 14 games of the season, you know how many RBIs the Mets have? 87. You know, that's the second most in franchise history. I mean, they're, they're ranked fourth in RBIs Mikey, in stop with the stats. You know what you do to the Mets when you start whipping out stats. All right, you know, I mean, do I have to bring – don't make me bring up the All-Star break again. You know, oh, I mean, man. come on, man, come on. 
Hey, maybe Colorado, it's because they're allowed to smoke weed now. You know, I mean, it's legal there in the state of Colorado, so maybe they're all. Maybe that's no. why they were so warm. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I was watching the game, watching, you know, I know it was cold, but, you know, watching Tejada with those throws, I mean, come on. Hey, it was almost as bad as watching Brett Favre when he was still with the Packers. In the in that uh, playoff game against the Giants, the Giants. He was, he was yeah. so cold, he just wanted to, you know, f- throw his Super Bowl chances away and, and go run into the locker room. But speaking of football, let's get to football before we run out of time. I mean, time is flying. Uh, before we uh, talk about the Giants and then ultimately uh, bitch and moan about the Jets, a um, couple of major moves in the NFL that we never got to talk about. Wes Welker, um, Reggie Bush, uh, both uh, changing teams. Wes Welker now. Was with the uh, Broncos, which I, I think is gonna, you know, uh, I thought the Broncos were one of the best teams in the NFL last year, and uh, Wes Welker is gonna definitely help them. And uh, he signs a two-year deal uh, with the Broncos, uh, uh, which is interesting. But Reggie Bush signs a four-year deal with the Lions. What's your thoughts on both of those moves? I think they're both great moves for both players. Um, Reggie Bush first; he's going to a team with a, a fantastic quarterback and someone who can actually throw the ball and, and, and gain chunks of yardage. And you got Calvin Johnson he's throwing to. I mean, you know, they got to fear the pass in Detroit where they didn't fear the pass in Miami. So that's just going to open up things for, for Reggie. I mean, eventually, I, I think he takes over the starting uh, uh, running back role over uh, over the kid uh, that's playing there now. Um, I, so I think it's great for him. And as far as Welker... Uh, you know, you heard reports out of New England that as soon as uh, West signed with uh, with uh, you know Denver and, and Peyton Manning, uh, Brady was just furious. I mean, don't forget Brady reconstructed his contract for things like this. I mean, how do you, how do you take away this target? Yeah, but who did they and, pick up? They picked up somebody pretty good too. Who who did who did the Patriots pick up to replace Welker? I forget, but they, I they did. But I, yeah, he I don't think he's a, a slot receiver like. Um, like uh, Wes Welker is. I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up right now. They did pick somebody up. Well, while you're looking that up, um, I will say this: the Giants uh, have bragged that was in the uh, newspapers this past week that they uh, they're they're predicting, which is very un ungiant like they're predicting a return to the Super Bowl this season, um, which uh, I guess they want to play uh, in Giants or it's not Giants Stadium anymore. I guess the Super Bowl will be in New York, right? Isn't the Super Bowl going to be in New York? Yeah, Super Bowl's in New York. This- Sure. Yeah. Well, they re-signed David Carr, which was which I think is I, I love David Carr. I know you're not a big fan of him, but I love him, and uh, I'm glad the Giants uh, got him. They also locked in pretty much their offensive line, which is a smart move. You know, I, listen, you know how much I hate the Giants. I I, I absolutely hate them, but you know, I, I, you got to give the organization credit. They do the smart things. You know, the the nucleus in football, just like we're talking about the nucleus in baseball, is pitching. The nucleus in football, aside from your stud quarterback, has to be the offensive line. And, 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 and you know, on the opposite side of the ball, too, defensive line. And the Giants are solid on both their fronts. And everything else you can, you, can, you know, tweak here and tweak there. But the, the, the nucleus of that offensive line, which protects Eli, is the key to, to the success. And, and I think they did a smart move uh, as, as opposed to uh, their, their rivals across town. Well, uh, listen, Jerry Reese has, has proven he's uh, he's a dynamite GM. Um, the year that they won the Super Bowl, you know, um, he shocked everybody. He's like, I don't, you know, sometimes you just don't need to make moves. And he says, I believe in the talent that we have. And lo and behold, they win their second Super Bowl in five years, two years ago. So, um, and that and their offensive line is key. When when Eli is upright. Okay, he's one of the best in the in the league. I know you don't want to hear that. No. You know, but you know, <laughs> it, that's just the bottom line. And I keep telling you that you know, if I had a chance to trade up Eli for Sanchez, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Well, yeah, that's. Yeah, you know, hey, it, um, is, it is what it is. But wh- why know, are they? Yeah, they, they just seem to make they just seem to make the right moves. Well, why are and they? Speaking of, I'm sorry. Wh- I want to know why they're dragging their feet with Victor Cruz. They're not dragging their feet with Victor Cruz. They they they, they gave they signed. They gave him a, a tender, uh, which is like you know, two point nine million. He's an unrestricted free agent. Last night, the clock struck zero for Victor Cruz. Nobody else in in, in football um, gave him an offer sheet. So basically, he, you know, and plus they offered him seven million a year plus fifteen to eighteen million guaranteed, and he turned it down. 
I mean, Victor Cruz thinks he's a $15 million a year player, which is nonsense. Well, what, what's crazy about him is he could make the extra $5 million in, in, in endorsements being in Absolutely. New York that he can't yeah. make in other cities. Yeah, and, 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 and memo to Victor Cruz, look what happened to Steve Smith. Okay. Who? Steve. Steve yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to Philadelphia. I make tons of money. He gets hurt. He lost. You know how many millions of dollars Steve Smith lost because he didn't sign the contract before he got hurt. See, people don't realize that baseball, like Santana and all these guys, you know, they they get hurt when they're leaving. You know, they 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 sign the contract and fall down the stairs and never play again. They get their money. Football, it's not like that. You know. No, it's not guaranteed. So you know, listen. I understand Victor Cruz wants to make money. He wants to, you know, he wants a paycheck. But you know what? Seven million dollars a year. I don't know how many years it was, but I know it was like fifteen to eighteen million guaranteed. Well, that's let's, not bad. Let's Plus, you said endorsements being yeah. in New York in in the in the biggest market in the world. Unbe I mean, unbelievable how much more money those guys can make in New York. And and I mean, I just look at even Sanchez and and Eli Manning with the with the commercials that that, that are on in New York all the time that become national commercials. You know, remember the one when they were throwing the I think it was long distance. I think it might have been AT and T or Verizon or something where they're throwing the football. And the footballs are like landed in in other states and stuff, and it all started right. with Eli and, and Sanchez. But uh, yeah, I mean he, he's rolling he's rolling the dice, and, and and like last night, see now now the ball's in his court because he hasn't gone to the voluntary um, camps, uh, camps right, the, the the workouts there, the, which which he doesn't have to because they're voluntary. However, you know they gave him an offer of two point nine. First, he turned down the the multi million dollar offer because he thought seven million dollars was just you know they were underpaying him that's what he thought so now it's it's take the 2.9 or nothing right, right. nothing or, or say okay i'll take the seven million plus the 15 to 18 guaranteed i don't know what you know he's got no other alternative no there's no other team out there that offered him anything no nah, he's he's it, crazy he comes from the uh streets practically a uh, very poor family and uh uh, he's uh, he's crazy, but uh, hey, you know, as much as the Giants do smart moves, <laughs> we look at our boys, and uh, they they have to be the stupidest franchise in the history of the sport. I mean, um, I, you know, you called it. I think it was our last show. You said that they're they're going to be bringing in Gerard. I laughed. I said, why would they bring in a, a almost forty year old guy hasn't thrown a pass in two years? Uh, and lo and behold, they bring him in, and they promise this guy. Uh, that he's going to get a legitimate shot at, at a starting quarterback. And then all of a sudden, uh, the, you, you know, when you start to look at the Jets right now, you, you got you got Sanchez, who's who's not going anywhere. We we all know that. You got Gerard, who's been promised a shot. Tebow is still with the team, and they're actually, uh, f you know, f faltering, uh, thinking that they might keep this guy because he's not willing to, to, to change his position. They still got, what's his name? Uh, from from uh, McElroy from from Alabama, um, they got uh, uh, Sims, the other Sims kid, and they're looking at the guy from West Virginia uh, as a quarterback uh, in a possible draft pick. You know, I, I I don't think they know what the hell they're doing. I I mean, they're ultimately only going to be able to keep a, a couple guys. Well, they're they're holding out hope that somebody takes Tim Tebow off their hands. But he won't change. ridiculous trade last year. They What's will, that? they would, they could trade him. They, other teams have said that they would consider taking Tebow if he was willing to change his position. And he says no. They bring in um, Garcia and uh, somebody else. I forget who the other guy was to try to tutor the Jets quarterbacks. And, and they all laughed. They all said this whole team is filled with a bunch of junk quarterbacks. Um, uh, Jeff well, Garcia. Sanchez, Sanchez went to Garcia. Who was the to, other to, guy? Who was the other guy? Sanchez, Jeff, Jeff Garcia used to be with Marty Morningweg, the uh, the, the uh, offensive coordinator for the Jets when who, he was in Philadelphia. Who hasn't won a game so, and who hasn't won? Have been on well, a winning he, team he's, ever? He's, he's, Marty's a, he's a terrible head coach. You know, he got a, he had a terrible year in, uh, in 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 Detroit. But Sanchez went to Garcia to help. You know. With it's the West Coast the tutoring on the West Coast offense, and uh, listen, uh, listen, I'm not making excuses for Sanchez. Was I, I've I've never been a fan of his. I think they they overrated him when they when they moved up in the fifth position to pick him. However, that being said, he has no weapons. Uh, he had no weapons last year. He's got no weapons this year. And this is what his third offensive coordinator in five years. Yeah. So and I mean, the guy really hasn't he hasn't had an easy road. 
to be honest. I'm not like again. I'm not making excuses. I don't want him on the team. I know. I know. But but, but even know, that, that being said, I mean, he, he he does. If he wants to start using some excuses, he does have some. Even so, so they bring in Garcia, Je, uh, Jeff Garcia, to to help them a little. And then they also brought in Vinny Testaverde to help uh, uh, Tebow. And between Garcia and Vinny Testaverde, they said all the quarterbacks on this team suck. Basically, they said it. They said that that uh, you know, that no matter how much they work with these guys, they just don't think that they're uh, going to make it. I, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I have to agree. I, I think. Well, I, I've never been a fan of Tebow. Um, Sanchez, you know, he he went to two. Uh, AFC championship games, but you know what? He had a solid team around him. There's there's nobody on this team at the quarterback position that is is quote unquote an elite quarterback or even close to being, uh, you know, a top ten quarterback in this league. They're all game managers, and you need a tremendous amount of talent around you. With, you know, a great offensive line. You need a solid running game. You need receivers that are going to catch the ball. Um, it, and they have none of this. So, I mean, you know, even with Tom Brady on this team, you know, I mean, it's, it's still going to be a tough, uh, tough for any quarterback. So, uh, listen, this, this is going to be, man, I, I can't, I can't imagine. I, mean, I knew, I, I knew last year it was going to be a tough year and we all did. I mean, every, every, every knowledgeable jet fan knew that when Rex Ryan got up at the podium and said, Oh, this is the most talented team I've ever had. Hey, you know, he was just talking crap. Well, knew it. speaking of Rex Ryan, he also said that, uh, you know, pretty much he's already said it and, and it's been printed that uh, Sanchez will be the start. He will t- be taking the first snap uh, of the season. He's already made that decision, which is totally ridiculous. What's going on with Revis? I've heard rumors that, you know, they're 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 waiting and that Tampa's still interested a little bit. And uh, then then I heard something the other day that they're going to keep him for the year. Rex swears that it was only speculation. They didn't want to get rid of him. You know, they're waiting for the draft. They're waiting for the rehabilitation. All of these things. What, what's going on with this clown? Which I I don't even want to see him on the Jets, man. I just I just I, you know he's a cancer. He's a you talk about a cancer on a team. He's only about himself. When you you mention guys like. Uh, Brady and 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 Eli Manning taking pay cuts and restructuring their contracts so that they can keep winning teams intact. Understanding that it's a team, it's not just one player. And then you look at the Jets, and uh, they got guys on this team that uh, all they care about is themselves. And heading that list is uh, is Darrell Rivas. Yeah, you know what? You and I both said that after the second holdout. You know, we wanted the Jets to trade Rivas then. And actually, we talked about you know trying to move up to get Cleveland's pick number three to get uh, Richardson, who I know you're a fan of because you're Love an him. Alabama guy. Love him. Yeah. So I mean, we we were yelling uh, you know on the top of the mountain about this. So now, uh, the problem is now he's damaged goods. Now you know not everybody's Adrian Peterson. You don't know how he's going to come back. You don't know if he's going to lose a step. You don't know if he's going to be the same lockdown corner that he is. Tampa Bay, you know they 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 want to they'll give you the first round pick, which is 13, but they don't want to give you the second round or the third round. I mean, it's just – I mean, it's going to go down to the wire. It's going to go down to like when everybody's at the draft and, you know, the Jets are just about on the clock. That's what it's going to go down to. It's going to go down to the very last – the Jets are going to try and get whatever they can can for Darrell Rivas. And Tampa Bay needs this guy. I mean, they're, they're a solid team, but you know where they were terrible last year? Pass defense. You know, mm-hmm. ru- they were number one in rush. Past defense, they were the worst. So, does this guy help? You know, put them. Uh, that's you know, one step closer to the playoffs. Absolutely. You know, I always said Darrell Revis is is the missing piece to a good team. Okay. T- even though Tampa did not make the playoffs last year, and they had that terrible stretch where they lost like four games in a row towards the end of the season, this would definitely help get them to the next level. Having Darrell Revis on the Jets is not getting us to the playoffs. It's not getting us to the next level. We have so many holes to fill, starting with the quarterback, that it's 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 a joke. So, again, it's going to come down to the very last minute, and I don't see him playing on the Jets this whole season. I just don't see it. I, the I don't, only other alternative is he starts as a Jet, but you have to trade him by October 31st. Now, let's say he he does stay, he starts as a Jet. What if he gets injured again? What okay. if he, he he slows down? What if teams starting to uh, you know, wide receivers are beating this guy at the line. They're going to say, "Oh, what? Well, he's not the same player." Then you're going to get even less for him. 
So it, it's – listen, I, I am not <laughs> – I, I feel for John Itzik because he's in a he's just in a terrible situation. He's almost in like a no win situation right now. He's cleaning up this mess that Mike Tannenbaum, um, you know, created with these contracts and you know, the, the 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 Sanchez contract at eight point two five guaranteed. And I mean, it's just a mess. Yeah. But you know, you, if I was the Jets, I wouldn't roll the dice and start this guy. As a New York Jet, because if he gets injured, I try to get rid of him now. That's right. that's their best bet, and and just get what you can get and hold out, hold your breath, and and, and see what uh, Tampa Bay decides. I agree. I think we got to get him off the team before, uh, which isn't going to happen, but before the uh, uh, draft, which uh, obviously is not going to happen. And I, I I hate to say this, and is is as hard as it's going to come out out my mouth. Uh, but uh, they need to rip a page out of the Giants playbook and go back and, and get to basics because check that out. I mean, their offensive line, you know, was starting to come around last year, I thought. And, um, you know, right now you got Nick Mangold, who, who's arguably, you know, the best center in, in NFL. I mean, you, you know, maybe top. He's definitely top three, you know, and you could argue that he's the best. The guy that, that Rex drafted – that just has not lived up to expectations, but they're trying to keep him on that team. Uh, I can't even pronounce his last name, Schlotterdorf or something like that. Um, he's he's on the team um, still, and DeBrickshaw Ferguson, who gets tossed around like a rag doll, um, and, and they also have um, – um, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm confusing him with uh, that Schlotterdorf with somebody else. But you, you, Are you confusing him with Matt Slauson? No, no, Matt Slauson, my, what I was gearing up for all of this is they let Matt Slauson, Matt Slauson was replacing the guy that, that, um, um, that uh, Rex Ryan drafted, uh, and, and he, he outplayed him all year. Oh, you're, you're talking about uh, Vla- Kaleeb oh, that, Shlav, Shlav Yeah, that, that, that's who I Deer just, off. that's I, who I, I can't even, he's that's from who, Utah. That's who yeah, I was trying, yeah, yeah that's that, that's who I meant. When I when I said Nick, that's who's left, that, and he's penciled in as the starter. And they let Matt Slauson and Brandon Moore go, okay, right. and, and Jason right. Smith. All three of those guys are, are off the team. Actually, uh, Brandon Moore isn't off the team yet, but it doesn't look like they're going to re-sign him. Now, the Matt Slauson guy is a lineman that I would have kept. Number one, they got rid of him for nothing. I think he sold a, a, I think he signed a, 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 a deal that was like $2 million or something like that. It wasn't a, a, a double-digit number, right? And this guy was a rookie. This was the guy that grabbed, um, uh, what's his name, Holmes by the throat in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in Miami the huddle, game. yeah, and said, you know, this is our quarterback. Shut the f up, you know, right. and uh, and and this is the guy that that said, uh, you know, pulled no punches and told the world that uh, uh, Tebow couldn't hit the side of a barn if he tried if he was standing ten feet away from it. I mean, this is the rough and tough kind of lineman I want on my team, man. I I'm sorry, but that's what I want. That reminds me of the Bill Parcells lineman of the of yesteryear and and all those guys. And they let him go for nothing, Mike. You know, I I mean, to me, that's a stupid, stupid move. What what's your thoughts? I mean, I know he was was he, he wasn't exactly an all star, but he's the he's the mentality that you want. You know, what makes Belichick so successful is he drafts people with certain mentalities, not so much the superstars, and they fit into his system. That's something the Jets haven't grasped yet. They try to pick these talented guys. You know how they perform, uh, um, you know, and, and the combines and and what have you. But they're not thinking about you know mentally and and how they fit into the scheme. What's your thoughts? I, you know, I can't agree more. Uh, uh, Slauson, and then you got a guy like who I who actually fits exactly what you were saying on the defensive side of the ball, Mike Devito. Oh, unbelievable! We, they got rid of him uh, for uh, nothing too, right? Yeah, I mean, he went to Kansas City, and and you. you you know, you knew that was going to happen. Pahua? That's, that, that's the thing. The Pahua guy, he's gone. Oh, he, I think he went to New England, right? One of them went to New England. One of those guys. They got rid of, uh, there was four linemen that, that uh, went, and one went to New England. Yeah, I, I think it was Pahua. No, let, me, let me tell you right now. Oh, uh, speaking of New England, when we were talking earlier about the receivers, it was Danny Amendola they picked up. Oh, see, you know, I thought it was somebody bigger than that. No, they picked up... Uh, 
Amendola from uh, St. Louis, who was hurt most of the year. But the thing about Amendola, he's only 27, and Welker's, what, 32, 33? So they got a little bit more use out of Amendola. But as far as, as the defensive player, um, tackles, I'm looking at their... Uh, well, why are you looking up that? The Jets are also uh, rumored about uh, um, looking to get... Uh, uh, Chris Ivory from the Saints. Uh, you know, they they Chris Ivory signed his deal um, that gave the Saints uh, the ability to trade him if they want. Uh, he's got a two million dollar tender deal, one year deal, uh, and the Jets apparently are very interested in Chris Ivory. Obviously, we don't have any running backs left. Uh, we got rid of the only guy that I thought could run the ball for us. I'm very disappointed that uh, that we did uh, lose uh, our starting running back, but. Um, nonetheless, I, I don't know if Chris Ivey's the the uh, the answer. I mean, here's a guy that I know on paper he's real good and everything else, but he's already been uh, you know on on uh, on uh, the uh, the Saints for three years. In 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 that, or I guess this is his fourth year. Um, you know, he's had a combined 256 attempts, 1,300 yards, eight touchdowns. It, it averages out to be. 64 carries, 327 yards, and two touchdowns a year. I think we need a little more than that, Mike. Yeah, but how, how many? What's his his yards per carry? It's over five, correct? Five point one. But but I mean, so what? You know, yeah. I, you know, when 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 you're when you're being sprinkled in behind Mark Ingram and and Darren Sproles and and Pierce Thomas. I mean, those are the other guys ahead of him. You know. I, well, that you you just answered the question. Look at the backfield; it's crowded. And when's the guy going to play? And, and 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 let's not forget who the quarterback of the Saints is. All right, the but, guy that throws the ball fifty times a game. But Ivory isn't the kind of dur- we we need a durable back. We need a running back. But that's this gonna- guy's not a guy that gets hurt. I I love. He him. doesn't play. I hope we get him. Where did he I play? Co- him. Where did he play college? I don't even know. I don't know where he played college. I don't. But well, I just, I, I, listen, as a, as a fantasy guy, I used to watch Chris Ivory. I'm like, why don't they play this guy more? I mean, he's a beast. He's he reminds me of the um, who was the back that used to play for Dallas. He retired not too long ago. He he went from Dallas to um, Chicago, the Bears. Really, just a, he's a tough runner. He's a just in your face runner. Oh, I know who some, you mean. Some, some um, speed in him. Barrier, uh, a barber. Yes, Marion Barber. Marion Barber. That's who he reminds me of. Okay, you sprinkle him in with with Mike Goodson. You throw a little Bialy Powell in there. Okay, I think that's an improvement from last year. I'd rather have Chris Ivey than Sean Green. I say go for it. Listen, man, I have no problem build, rebuilding the team. I really don't. I have no problem. Same thing when we were talking about the Mets. Start, you know, look, if they're going to trade Revis, if they, you know, they're dumping some of the guys that, that aren't fitting in, um, you know, then, then get your draft picks, stock up on draft picks, get some youth in there, get some young running backs, you know, and, and, and go that route. You know, you have a, an offensive coordinator that's going to be one and done. He's, he's not going to be with the Jets after next year, guaranteed. You know, he's one of the worst historically. One of well, the neither, worst. Will, neither will Rex Ryan. That's what I'm you know, saying. You, yeah. Oh, I thought you said. I think it's about uh, Marty Morningwig. No, I, I am. I'm talking about Marty. I, I am talking about Marty Morningwig. But I'm saying he's not going to be with the team, and neither. And you make a point. Neither is Rex. So that, that's my point. You know, why pick up these these guys? Uh, you know, get some draft. Get some get get some playing time with these kids, and and you know, have them ready to to go with a new system after after this season, because that's what they're going to have to do. I, I, you know, uh, I just yeah, but we need we need some NFL ready players right now. And focus hey, listen, on uh, listen, the Chris line. Has proven himself a quality back when he's in the game. NFL NFL level players now. What I would be doing if I'm the Jets is I'd be stockpiling my lines. I want two solid lines defensively and offensively. Now the Jets over the last ten years have not really went to free agency. For the most part, they have once or twice for, for, for established linemen. They have done pretty well in the draft and, and, and raising their own, you know, homegrown linemen. But then they get rid of them too quickly, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I think they need to focus on that. Defensive line, who, who do we got left? We have nobody. Oh. We, we had nobody. We had the two rookies. Well, they're not even both rookies. We had those two guys that are finally coming into their own. But you have no help now. You, you know, what people don't understand and and hopefully I know you do understand, and I know you know diehard fans understand that 
those Mike DeVitos and, and Puhuhas and, and uh, the unsung heroes that you never hear of, like back in the sack exchange days, uh, Abdul Salan and, 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 uh, and, and, and Marty, Marty, Lyons. Uh, Marty Lyons, those were the guys that opened up the sacks for the star guys that got yeah, all the Klecko rest. And, and Gaston, exactly. Absolutely. Well, it's the same thing with with the Jets. You know, they get rid of the the the, the, the grunts. They get rid of the Marines uh, out of the line, and you know they're expecting all these high things from the two uh, young kids, and and they just got rid of their 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 you know security blanket. Same thing with the running backs. You know, they 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 expect uh, what's his face to carry the load, but they get rid of uh, Anthony Thomas or Tom, whatever his name was that went. Yeah, with I the mean, bed. as far as the, what they have now, I mean, you got Muhammad Wilkinson who saw, who started coming into his own last year. He looked good. You can't deny yeah, that. Yeah, I, I don't deny that. You, you know, you got a second year player in Quinton Copels. You know, we got to see what he. You know, what he, he looked. Brings you know what? He year. surprised me more. Than Wilkerson coming into his own, I he really did. I, I give Copels a lot of credit because the knock on him was that he he, he lazy. he's lazy, right? And he played well last year, right? I thought so, he did. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. As far as now, you, you, you defensive tackles, okay. You got Kenrick Ellis, all right. You got uh, Antonio Gary. I mean, I mean uh, nobody, right? Nobody. They had Devon Mike De- Harrison. They they I mean, had they had Devito. Who are these guys? They could have kept Devito and Puhuha fairly cheap. At least one of them. And Puhuha, I could see getting rid of because he gets hurt every year. He does. But Devito is a solid player, man. Not only so, solid, but he's nasty. I love that kind of you need you need those guys in line, man. You need the nasty guys that you you, you know the guys that are gonna. Be, I hate to say it. But those guys that you'll find at the bar having a few pitches of beer and stuff, those are the tough guys that play football. You know, I'm not saying all guys drinking beer are, are tough, but I'm saying that's the mentality I see when I see a Mike DeVito or, or you know, in this case, a, uh, a, a, a Matt Slauson. You know, I mean, those guys, um, I, they're the guys I want to, to, yeah. to anchor, anchor, guys. Yeah, that's, anchor that's, my that's line. Exactly that's what I want. Bill Parcells was very successful in his whole coaching career with picking guys just like that. And uh, uh, the Jets, uh, they're not doing it, man. We still got you? I lost you. I knew uh, I knew we uh, we must have lost Brooklyn Mike. We'll try and uh, uh, get him back here in a second here. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line is, uh, oh, now we uh, got some issues with... Uh, uh, with the uh, with the system, so we're gonna have to wait a couple minutes for uh, for Brooklyn Mike. So uh, I'll get to him in a sec. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, my whole point about uh, these guys and and uh, uh, you know having uh, anchored uh, anchoring linemen is, is the key. You know, and and here's the other key: the Jets. I, I mentioned this a couple minutes ago with with Mikey. And uh, the Jets are, are, are looking at uh, possibly drafting uh, another quarterback. Now, now, be it. It's not going to be in the early rounds. They're, they're thinking that it could be anywhere from the third to the sixth round in the draft. And they're looking at um, the quarterback from uh, West Virginia, which I, I think would be a ridiculous move. I mean, the Jets have too many quarterbacks. Now, granted, uh, you put them all together and maybe you have one. But still, why go through the motions, you know? Um, they need to stockpile uh, offensive linemen. They need to get uh, some running backs. They need some defensive linemen. I mean, the the team is in disarray right now. And, oh, by the way, don't forget about the receiver position. I mean, you know, this is something that I want to talk to Mike about here in a second. But, you know, one of the most important guys I think that the Jets have to get back, and they haven't yet. He's not signed, but he's not signed with anyone else either, is Braylon Edwards. This guy is the only receiver that Mark Sanchez feels comfortable with. It's proven. When he was with the Jets, he helped the Jets. They got rid of him. Mark Sanchez stumbled and bumbled and fumbled, and he ran up people's butts and everything else. And then they bring him back for those last couple of games last year, and all of a sudden Sanchez is completing passes again. Um, Not enough to win and to to get them any place uh, other than the seller. But the truth of the matter is, is Braylon Edwards has to be signed. Now, who do they have on their team so far as receivers? Well, they have Santiano Holmes, Santiano Holmes um, who I think is one of the most overrated uh, receivers in the NFL. They have Stephen Hill, who was their number one draft pick last year, uh, who uh, um, showed some promise, but he also showed some stone hands. I mean, this is a guy that, that uh, dropped a lot of passes, um, ones that were uh, thrown right to him. So uh, that wasn't uh, 
uh, very, in, 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 uh, very enlightening for, for me to see Stephen Hill. Plus, he came from a, a, a college with Georgia Tech that generally doesn't even throw the ball that much. So, you know, again, that was a stupid uh, draft pick, uh, uh, even though, you know, the, the jury's still out on him. Then you got the, the rest of the, 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 the lineup for receivers. Jeremy Curley, who, no disrespect to Curley, but, you know, um, who, who is, uh, who's Curley? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he did well for the Jets last year, but uh, they need, uh, they need a bigger name than uh, Jeremy Curley on, on, on the team. Uh, I'm sorry, they, they just do. Um, they also have uh, uh, some other guys that uh, I've never heard of. I mean, uh, Clyde Gates, I've heard of. Jordan White, I've, I've never seen him play. Emmanuel uh, Akronow, I never saw him play. Royce Adams, never saw him play. I mean, so this is our, uh, uh, this is our uh, receiving core right now. You know, so, uh, you know, that's what we got uh, uh, to look forward to uh, with uh, with the receivers. So um, we will uh, we will see. I think I got you back. Are you back? Yeah. You know, I was hearing you loud and clear. Yeah. I didn't hear a word you said. And uh, I got stuff going on with the system. So I apologize for that. I had to uh, uh, reboot everything. Reboot. Here. OK, I thought but, so. But uh, but anyway, I was just uh, dancing a little bit and I was talking about. Uh, the receiving situation, I want to get your thoughts. You know, they haven't re-signed Braylon Edwards yet. And, and dude, I, you know, if they do one thing, there's so many things I can complain about the Jets uh, for doing. I mean, we could, we could focus two hours on how stupid they are. But, please, I, I, I beg Rex Ryan and the rest of the people making the decisions, you got to get Braylon Edwards back on this team. He's not a big-dollar guy. He's the only security blanket that – that poor, weak old Mark Sanchez has, and he's a good player. I, I like the guy. What's your thoughts? There's no doubt about it. He he's the only security blanket for Mark Sanchez, and uh, it like you said, it's not going to cost a lot of money. It's basically, you know, as far as I see, you know, <clears throat> this is not Rex Ryan's team. It's John Itzik's team because Ryan is pretty much done after this year. Yeah, you know, it's like they set Mark Sanchez up to fail. They're doing the same thing for Rex Ryan. You know, you look at this receiving core. You got San Antonio Holmes coming back from an injury. You got that Smurf Jeremy Curley uh, as your slot receiver. Um, you got second-year player uh, Stephen Hill, who really didn't light it up in his first year. Uh, you know, he, he got speed, but you know he needs to learn how to run better routes and, and keep his hands on the ball. <clears throat> Other than that, there's no. I, I'm looking Nobody. at these names. I can't tell you who they are. Uh, Clyde That's, Gates. We. I. I. We, I saw Clyde Gates. Uh, you know, he played. He. He got a couple of good catches towards the end of the year. But I've never seen or heard of Jordan White, Emmanuel Akronu, Royce Adams, Joe Collins, Vidal Hazelton, Thomas Mayo, Royce Pollard, and Titus Ryan. I've never heard of any right. of them. Right. Where exactly. did they come that's, from? That's, that's the point. Where did they come from? Were they on our practice squad? Were they on our team? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, it, you know, that's that's it. I mean, we're going to take guys from the practice squad. I mean, you gave away his his only security blanket to the Miami Dolphins, which was the tight end. And uh, which was ridiculous. Know. They don't have any tight ends now. And, and they're looking at tight end for the draft. I mean, they're looking at these positions in the draft that they got rid of. And, and the guys they got rid of weren't we weren't we're not talking about uh, Darrell Revis across the board we're, we're talking about Matt Slauson who signed for for under two million with the Bears you're talking about um uh what's his name uh, the receiver I mean the tight end you're you're, you're referring to uh, Jeremy um uh what was his name uh, uh no Dustin 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 uh, Keller Dustin Keller right yeah. you know he didn't sign for big bucks to go to Miami I mean here's a guy that they could have kept he was the most solid tight end they had you know and and uh, you know, just stupid, stupid moves, Mike. It's so frustrating. I, you know, I mean, I, I can't. Just as frustrating as it was talking about the Mets, it's even more so with the Jets. And and you know, they're already starting the the early camps, and they're, they're just looking pathetic. And we're hearing the same old rhetoric out of there. I mean, it's just a joke. And then you got you got your idol there, Rex Ryan, cutting up the Baltimore Orioles. He's got. He's got no business talking about anything. He should shut the f up and just focus on the Jets because there's enough problems right at home. Yeah, no, absolutely. He's got no business chir chirping about the Orioles and the uh, the Ravens. Mind your mind your own business. You got your own problems to worry about. Here's a guy that's gonna be looking for a job next year, and I guarantee it's not gonna be a head coaching job because when he finishes his season next year at four and twelve, who's gonna hire this guy as a head coach? 
Well, the the sad thing is, is if the guy finishes with a respectable record, and and judging by the Jets' schedule, it's not exactly an easy schedule. I don't know how they pulled that schedule out for the Jets. I mean, uh, looks pretty hard to me. What, what's your thoughts? Well, uh, let's let's go let's go through it. I'm looking at it right now. Let's now the first game of the season intrigues me because it could be Darrell Revis versus uh, the New York Jets as they play the Buccaneers on September 8th, which is their opening game. So right then and there, I mean, you got to favor the Buccaneers with or without Revis. I just think they're a better team, right? Well, you know, I mean, I'm, let's, let's 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 do wins and losses. Let's just take a shot. All right, well, we'll hurry I know it's up early. because no, we we got we can't we, take in the injury factor, obviously, because everybody's healthy. But just just as an opponent right now, first game of the season, you give them a win or a loss against Tampa Bay. I give them a loss. Okay, let, I'm 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 doing this right now. Yeah, let's just run. Well, wait a minute. So do, we're this isn't our official predictions. Let's no, wait and no, see. No, 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 no. Let's just go no. through it. We only got about six minutes, so hurry up. Right, that's all it is. Okay, I give them a loss as well. Right. Uh, four days later, they got to play the Patriots. Are loss. you kidding me? Loss. At New England. Loss. Okay, we know that. That's two losses. They're zero and two. <laughs> then you got the Bills. I'm gonna give them a win against the Bills. I don't know. The Bills are. Well, I, 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 it's at home. You know they play the Bills tough. Uh, you know I'm gonna give them a win. How about you? Uh, uh they're, they're playing the Bills at home. Yeah, not at Buffalo. They're playing in, in Jersey. I'm giving them oh, a yeah. loss. I'm giving them a oh, loss. Are you I, the, serious? The, You're gonna go the, 0-3 to first, start uh, of the season? Oh, okay. 3 because the the Buffalo Bills are a team the Jets always struggle with, man. And 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 the Buffalo Bills have made some smart moves. I. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm okay. gonna. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna give right now. The Jets don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. So any fifty fifties, I'm going the other way. So go ahead. What else okay. we got? Okay. Then we go uh, at the Titans. At the Titans, the Titans haven't done that much. I, I'd say the Jets win that game. Okay, so you got uh, you got to win there. I got I got to win there as well. I, I figured we take the Titans. Then we go to Atlanta. Well, we know that's going to happen. There. <laughs> Come on. Come on. That's what I'm saying. They have a tough schedule. Come on. They don't have a chance against okay. the Dirty Birds. Then, then we have two home games. We got Pittsburgh Steelers and the New England Patriots. Oh, yeah. So so right now, we're, it's, according to my record, we're 1-7. Uh, 1-6. <laughs> well, I, I, you, you're 1-6, one and, one and, and I'm 2-5. I'm and, uh -huh. and then we go from the Patriots. We got the Bengals. Uh, I'll give them the Bengals. You you think okay. they're going to beat the Bengals? Uh, I, like I said, the Bengals are a playoff not, team. Hold, we're not holding each other to these. They, right they, now, they, the saying. Bengals are a playoff team. Plus, they just solidified. What, what did who, they just signed somebody really good? Um, nah, I'm not giving. I'm not giving the Bengals. Right, so I, another loss by another Billy loss C. by Billy right. C. I got them one and seven right now. You got one and seven. Then First half the of the season at 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 uh, at home. Oh yeah, I got them one and eight right now. We got eight. All right, I'm giving them a loss to the Saints. Then we got a bye week. Oh, good. Got, I I think they'll win that one. And they'll, at at Baltimore. Uh, at Buffalo, uh, they'll they'll split against Buffalo. So whether oh, so they you're gonna, you're gonna give them the way. I'm win. gonna give I'm gonna give them a win whether they win the first game in Buffalo or whether they win the second. I'm gonna say they split Buffalo. So I'm gonna give them a win in Buffalo, but definitely a loss against the Ravens. Okay, so I already gave them my win against Buffalo at home. So I'm giving them two more losses right there. All right, so we're even. Then two, we have, two two and nine right now. Right, and I'm three and eight. Then we have uh, the Dolphins, and then the Raiders. Dolphins um, at home. I'm going to give a split with the Dolphins. So I'm going to take the home victory against the Dolphins. Yeah, I'll take the home victory against the Dolphins, and I also think they'll beat the Raiders too. So, okay, so we got. So I got I mean, four and, I got that, and nine. Oh. And then we got at Carolina. Yeah, they're not going to beat Carolina. Carolina was was a couple of players away from the playoffs this year, and. Uh, uh, I I think that uh, I, they're, they're going to be a good team this year. I, I'm I'm taking uh, Carolina. I agree. And then we got the last two games of the season. We got Buffalo. Um, I'm sorry, the Browns at home, and we got away Miami. Last last game of the season. Yeah, I, I said I was going to split the Miami game, so I'm going to I'm going to. Uh, uh, both of those are losses for the Jets. I, I got, I got. The, they're not going to beat the Browns. Richards is going to run all over the Browns, and the Browns are going to be an improved team this year. Um, they were my sleeper team last year, and and I think this year they're going they're going to do very well. Um, yeah, so I have the Jets finishing four and twelve. Four and twelve. Four and twelve. Yeah, I, I have them right now at five and eleven. But like I said, I even said four and twelve before, so I gave them the extra game. Again, it's it's inevitable. It's going to be a terrible losing season. Yeah. Well. 
You know, let's we'll, so we'll have uh, from now until September to cry and bitch and moan about it because that's exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. Hey, Mikey, on this day in New York sports history, April twentieth, in nineteen sixty-seven, and this is an amazing stat that that we're going to talk about today. What took place on this day because it, it's kind of almost a day behind what we've been talking about with uh, with Harvey. On this day, April twentieth, in nineteen sixty-seven, Tom Seaver pitches a 6-1 to one win for the Mets over the Cubs at Shea Stadium. It was his first Major League Baseball victory, and he would go on to finish uh, the season with 16 wins and 13 losses, but he became the first National League Rookie of the Year selected from a last-place team. So maybe uh, maybe we, we, we see some repeat in history uh, for, uh, for Harvey should the Mets uh, finish last. And also on this day, April 20th, 1983, in the very first playoff meeting between two New York NBA teams, the Knicks take the opener of a three-game series against the Nets, 118-107 to 107 at the Meadowlands. So a couple of things happening in uh, New York sports history on this day. Mikey, it's been a few weeks since we did the show. What's your final thoughts today? Well, final thoughts is I'm, I'm actually rooting for both of uh, New York uh, basketball teams to, uh, to advance into the playoffs. And uh, I'm looking forward to next week when we actually get to uh, break down the draft and to uh, pick apart the Jets for their ridiculous picks, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which is what we do every year. Hey, there's, uh, there's, that's three, it, brother. there's three things you know in life, Mikey. You know, you know you're going to die. You know you got to pay taxes, and you know the Jets are going to make some ridiculous picks in the draft because uh, they traditionally they have they've never really done. Uh, that well uh, in the draft with the exception of a, a handful of players my final thoughts is it's great to be back uh, I, I love doing shows with you and uh, uh, hopefully uh, our schedules will uh, keep us doing this and hopefully some other doors will open where we'll be forced to do this uh, on a regular basis I look forward to next week um, I'm a little psyched about the Mets I'm, I'm, I'm getting into them it took me a little while even though they they started off good I was a nay nay nayer but uh, now I'm starting to uh, uh, look at the glass half full, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, our young pitching uh, uh, can uh, can get it done, and uh, and maybe uh, have guys like Duda uh, shock you a little bit. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I have faith in him uh, at the bat, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I look forward to next week, my man. I do too, and I will say this: you will have a better, you you will have less agita rooting for the Mets this year than the Jets. Well, we already, we already put the kiss of death on the Jets. Maybe we didn't. Maybe maybe our maybe maybe they finished twelve and four, and and you and I look like idiots. But I'll I'll welcome that any day of the year, my man. Yeah, maybe I dunk a basketball. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you and me both. You <laughs> right. and me both. Hey, man, check out the fight. Make sure you watch the uh, Austin Trout fight tonight. Uh, it's going to be a good one against Canelo Alvarez. And, uh, of course, uh, we'll break down uh, uh, the big fight next week. Make sure you get a hold of me, Mikey. Uh, I want to get you scheduled to come on for our fight week on BillyCBoxing.com, uh, the week leading up to the big Mayweather Guerrero fight. I'm Billy C. I'm joined here with Brooklyn Mikey. And uh, like we always like to say after the show, ciao, baby. Mikey, we'll talk next week. Okay, brother. All right, we'll see you all next week.